Hi everybody, I'm Carl Bretzky. I'm a Minneapolis painter and I have a passion for nocturnes. And so today what I'd like to do is teach you everything that, um, that I think I've learned over the last 10 years of painting these both in the studio and uh, in a plein air situation. I'm going to start with a PowerPoint presentation and I believe I can uh, show you a little more rapidly some of the teaching points about painting nocturnes by showing you this first. After the PowerPoint presentation then I will actually show you a couple of demos in the studio. So let's get started. So I think a good place to start uh, with a nocturne presentation is just to show you some historic nocturnes. And within uh, that presentation, I want to show you first a James McNeil Whistler painting. Whistler was actually the one who reportedly coined the term nocturne painting. And his paintings, of course, uh, this was back in the 1800s, uh, without much artificial light. So a lot of these older historic nocturnes are moonlight uh, paintings. So here's one of Whistler's. And then you'll re recognize Van Gogh's style. This is Starry Night over the Rhone. Over the Rhone. And in this painting, uh, this was ap apparently done outside from life near his studio. But his most famous nocturne painting is the Starry Night, which I read he, has, uh, he actually did during the day in his studio. I was recently at a Monet exhibit in Denver, and there was this painting uh, that he had done, obviously, plein air. I want to show you a few illustrators' uh, work that uh, this was one of Remington's that uh, he was a Western illustrator and he did many nocturnes. Another Western illustrator, one that I really uh, enjoy his work, is Frank Tenney Johnson. He's a great draftsman and he manages to, to find real vibrant uh, color within these neutral greens and grays that he uses on these Western scenes. This painting surprised me. This is a John F. Carlson a Nocturne, and it surprised me only because I've read his landscape painting book so many times, which I consider one of the Bibles of landscape painting, and I never saw a Nocturne in this book, but uh, it's a beautiful Nocturne. There's a lot of great things to learn in this painting, lots of uh, nice uh, close values and lost edges. Ivan Shishkin, a famous Russian painter, one of my favorites, as well as uh, several others. This is an Anders Zorn painting done, obviously, during the day and uh, recognized by most of us, but I'm not sure how many of you have seen a nocturne of the same subject. Uh, but this was a beautiful nocturne. Charles Rollo Peters, he was a California painter in the late 1800s. And he was famous for painting uh, the California missions at night. And he did many nocturnes. And this is actually one of my inspirations uh, to paint nocturnes. I love the way he uses uh, cool and warm light together in the same painting. He could paint very uh, tightly like this, or he could paint a little bit more impressionistically. I think any discussion of historic nocturnes should include Nighthawks by Edward Hopper. I grew up with this painting. I had a poster of this as a child. All right, so why paint nocturnes? Uh, so there's several reasons, but one is that by painting a nocturne, you're essentially painting a still life. Many of us have painted uh, in events during the day or plein air painted during the day, and we all race against time because the light changes so quickly. But at night, of course, you don't have the changing light, so you can stay out quite late into the evening if you want and paint as long as you'd like on the same painting. If you do plein air events, it gives you an additional painting uh, to do during the day. When most people go out to eat at night, you just go out and do another painting. And then finally, um, the aesthetics of a plein air, of a nocturne painting, to me, there's, they seem very unified. And that's because when you think about it, you have the dark, the darkness of the sky, and you're going to see that same dark and same colors on the ground plane and all the upright planes. So you're going to have this dark kind of running through the entire painting. So it's not too dissimilar to a winter scene when you have a cloudy sky. So now you have 
light area in the sky, lightness of the snow on the ground, and on all of the top planes. So before we get into the uh, specifics about painting nocturnes, I want to just talk briefly about what's, what I term prismatic light and color. And as you may remember from your school days, if you take white light and pass it through a prism, it'll separate the light out into its color components, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. And the reason they separate is because they all have a different wavelength, and these different wavelengths then react differently through substances and scatter differently in the atmosphere. If you take the colors of the prism and wrap them around in a circle, you end up with the color wheel. And throughout this talk, I'm going to be using the term prismatic color shift. And what I'm referring to when I say that is when a color uh, changes from a green to a blue to a violet, or from a yellow to an orange to a red, I'm saying that that means the color is shifting prismatically. So the obvious example in nature is a rainbow itself, which really is a white light split into the prismatic colors by rain droplets. But you also see prismatic shift in sunsets, and they're always predictable. There's going to be a red to orange to yellow to green to blue. Less obvious, but also a prismatic shift. You can see modulation of the color of green in nature as it recedes into the distance, where the foreground greens will be more yellowy, and then the yellow will drop out and they become greener or uh, more orangey and then more red, and then more violet, and finally blue. And that's a prismatic shift because of the wave wavelength of these different colors. So Frank Vincent Dumon was an artist in the late 1800s, and he worked at the Art Students League in New York. And he kind of latched onto this concept, and he would tell his students that silently glowing over this whole landscape is a rainbow. You must learn to see it. It is always there. And I'm sure he was referring to some of these uh, examples that I just showed you where in nature you do see prismatic shift uh, in the sequence of a rainbow. He devised what is referred to as a prismatic palette. It was fairly complex, but if you look at this row, all, all it was was laying out his colors in a sequence of the rainbow, yellow, orange, red, and so on. And he handed that down through many teachers, including my teacher, Joe Paquette. And so what that has distilled down to for me is a palette where I lay out colors in a prismatic sequence on my palette. I'll be talking later about the exact colors. So let's look at some uses of the prismatic palette in nocturne painting. And one concept I want to talk about is our, our light halos. Light halos when I say the term, I'm referring to the uh, glow of light around a light source. So for instance, here's a yellowy white light, and you can see this cast of light around the light source in somewhat of a halo. And I want to just show you something kind of pseudoscientific. This is my finger underneath the light source. I'm going to now raise it up and cover the light source and then ask yourself, will you still see this halo around the light? So there it is, and the halo is now gone. So you don't. Let's try another one. Here's a red stoplight. If you look carefully, there's red all the way out to here, and I'm going to cover the, the stoplight itself with my finger. Will we still see this red out here? And you don't. So one more example. This is the moon. Obviously, a hazy glow around the moon. I'm going to cover the moon with my finger. Will we see the, the glow? And you do. So there's two different things going on here. And what's the difference between these concepts? Well, the first two are examples of intraorbital scatter. So if you have a bright light shining in your eye, your eye will not focus all of that onto one spot on your retina, instead it kind of scatters it around because of imperfections in your eye, and you get a halo. The, the last example of the moon is due to atmospheric particle scatter, and that's where light, if there's enough atmosphere between you and the light source, light will hit those particles and bounce off of them back to your eye, and every time it bounces back, that is an area where you'll see a glow. 
So here's an example of a street light. Uh, and typically you wouldn't see particle scatter necessarily unless the atmosphere is very dense for some reason. So you start seeing it on a rainy night or a foggy night or in a dust storm. And you can almost always tell that this is due to particle scatter because the, uh, the cone of light is, is directed at something. It's usually in the, in the direction that the light is facing. So a directional cone, that means particle scatter. This still has a halo as well from probably interorbital scatter. And you can use that in your painting. If you want to portray uh, a foggy night, for instance, just put a cone of uh, glow underneath one of your light sources. So before you learn how to paint light halos, you should just understand a couple of basic things. First of all, the halo itself around the light source is quite a bit down in value from the light source. Nothing will be brighter than that light source. Once you take this big step down in value and go out, then it diffuses out into the space around it. So if I put that photo into a black and white mode, I paint it and I hold it next to a grayscale, you can see that the light source is about a one or two on this grayscale. The sky is about a 10 or 11. And that halo starts at about a six. So again, a big jump from the light source to the halo. Here's an example of that in a painting. I have a yellow-white light source. The halo starts with somewhat of an orange color mixed with sky color. An orange out of the tube is about a five uh, on the grayscale. And so this is probably starting at about a six and then diffuses out into the sky. One thing to be aware of, however, light halos are always lighter than the background value. So if you have a light sky and you're going to paint halos, which you'll still see, remember that you're going to have to bring up the value of the halo and the sky together. So here it is painted in black and white. The light source is a one or two. The sky is now about a six or seven, and so the halo starts at about a three. So there's still a jump, but um, all these values are compressed, and you need to uh, paint accordingly. So if you have some white in your sky, such as near dusk, uh, you may have to add a little bit of white into your cadmium colors as you create this rainbow, uh, let's create this halo. So um, let's talk about the halo color itself. It'll depend on two things. It'll depend on the type of light source that you have, and then you'll need to see this prismatic transition to the background color. So this is a blog, a picture from a blog of James Gurney from several years ago, where he talked about the different colors of, of bulbs and of light, and it's related to the gas within the light bulb. So if you have a sodium vapor in the light bulb, it usually emits a more yellowish light. If you have mercury, it's more of a greenish light, metal halide, blue, white light, and so forth. So let's take a yellow light. Here's a yellow light. So the light source will be very bright, yellowish white, and now look at this prismatic shift of color in the halo. It goes from yellow to orange to red to violet. That's a prismatic color shift. And you can see that against the color wheel. It goes this way. Let's try a cool white light. This is a metal, hal metal halide light. And it's a little more subtle, but you can still see it goes from kind of a light greenish blue to a medium blue to a dark blue to a violet. And that, again, follows a prismatic shift. Here's an example of that in a painting. The light source is out of the painting, but if you look at the top of the painting, you can see the halo, which goes from light blue to medium blue to violety blue. How about a uh, mercury light? Here's a green light. We see these not uncommonly in the city. Uh, will that follow a prismatic shift? And it does. It goes from this kind of light green our, our uh, light, light green to a yellowy green to a blue to a darker blue. So again, it follows this pattern. There's one exception. I see this not uncommonly where you'll have a warm light and you'll be looking for orange to red to violet to sky. And just after the orange, you may see a ring of greenish uh, tint. And I don't know exactly why you see that, but you do see it not uncommonly. And when you do, it's quite easy to paint. Here was one from Door County a couple years ago 
orange in the middle. Out here, there's kind of a brownish violet mixing with sky, but in between, there's a layer of green. So how do you paint halos? There's a wrong way and a right way, I believe, to paint these. I think the wrong way is if you take, let's say, a white, yellow light, and here's a sky color, a violet, and for the halo, you just blend the two. You'll end up with a gray, not very pretty, not very convincing. Instead, if you had a bright yellow white light and this violet sky, if you run a series of color between the two that runs prismatically from yellow to orange to red and then blend the sky back over it, you'll end up with a much more interesting prismatic transition in that halo. Here's the wrong way and the right way. The wrong way, I've just mixed yellow with sky. You get this kind of ugly green. Whereas if you sequentially go from yellow to orange to red and so forth and then blend, you'll get a more convincing halo. So here's how I paint them. I'm going to also demonstrate this, but when I paint my sky, I'll leave an opening for the light source. I'll paint concentric rings of color moving down the prism. I'll add a little bit of sky color over the top and then I'll blend with a soft brush. I often use a synthetic brush a little larger than what I would normally use to put paint down with. I blend it. I still have the opening in the middle and then I'll lay down a little impasto for the light source and that'll be my completed uh, light halo on a nocturne painting. You can do that for multiple different colors of light. Just remember to use a, a prismatic sequence as you're laying the color down. You get them blended and put the light source in and now you can simulate light halos for almost any color light. All right, so now we're going to talk about neon. Neon, uh, I think a lot of people consider neon to be fairly exciting in a painting. And so I'm going to show you how to do it, but I want to preface it by telling you that it's really the same as painting any light. It's going to have a halo uh, and, and so forth. So let's go ahead and take a look. Here is neon. When you think about what that is, it's a linear bulb and it's usually attached to a sign. Immediately beneath the bulb, you're going to get a narrow band of illumination that's going to be down in value and prismatically shifted. And beyond that band of illumination, there's going to be another pretty rapid step off to then even a darker value and again further down the prism. So in this case, I have an orange neon just beneath it. It's going to look red and away from that band of illumination, it'll look more alizarin. The other thing to remember is just like any light source that's bright, you're going to still have a halo. So I tell people, treat the entire sign as a light bulb and then put your halo around it. So you can see in the photograph, this was when I was set up to do a plein air study of this, uh, you can see a halo here. And if I show you the completed painting, I think I can show you that this is now a pretty convincing light effect. That glow uh, makes this seem more real, and that glow is from the halo. Here is some blue neon. If you look closely, it's light blue. The illuminated area just beneath it is a medium blue, and then off to a darker blue. And then there's even blue out in the sky around it, which is the glow or the halo. An example of that uh, in a plein air piece from long, or from uh, uh, Miami, and here is some, a vertical neon sign, and I put a little bit of glow around it like this with a darker blue. So if you paint uh, your nocturnes in the studio, which is legitimate, you should be aware, however, of some camera effects. A couple of them uh, especially, and one is the concept of a starburst. I've had people ask me, why they don't see more starbursts in my paintings. And it turns out that starbursts are usually an artifact of a camera. So I found this on the internet, but someone took a picture of the same light uh, at different f-stop settings, which means they narrow the, the aperture of their camera. And at a narrow aperture, these rays become e more prominent, so a bigger starburst. If you count the rays, there are about eight of them. And if you look at the shutter of a camera, it's composed of eight leaves. And where they intersect, there's these little squared off areas. So it's these squared off areas of the shutter that give you 
uh, some random scattering that looks like rays or starburst pattern. Now that doesn't mean that we don't see starbursts occasionally with the naked eye. Sometimes we do. And in those situations, it's usually because we're looking at a very bright light and we're squinting so our pupils constrict. And then also from squinting, we start to cover our pupil with a little bit of our eyelid or an eyelash. And now you have a square edge along that circular pupil and it'll give you a starburst. And if you want to prove that to yourself, just look at any light uh, especially in a dark setting, and squint at, squint at it and you will see a starburst. If you do want to paint a starburst, I tell people just paint a halo. So here's a cool one. You can see I'm putting the concentric layers down, blending. And now when you get to this point, I usually drag the inner color out in a starburst pattern. And then because this looks contrived to me, I usually will uh, blur that a little bit like so. And that will be my starburst. Here's one used in a painting. This light was closest to me, the brightest, so I put a little starburst there, but it's subtle. You can see a little bit of a starburst pattern. Of interest, the other night I was sitting in uh, my kitchen and I was looking out at the street down below and I saw this perfect four-sided starburst. And I wasn't squinting and the light wasn't very bright and I thought I really shouldn't be seeing that. So I stood up and out the top of my window, the starburst disappears. So what it was, was I have screens on the bottom half of my window. And it's the little grid pattern, the square grid pattern in the screen that creates that four-sided halo. So that just confirms it to me that this is from squared off edges around an uh, aperture. Another important artifact of the camera regarding nocturnes is that if you look at this sign and I told you this was neon, I'd say what color is that neon? I mean, you might know from the globe, but everything looks white, you'll agree. Here's that same scene painted plein air and now you can see that this upper neon was orange, this was red, this was green and they all look the same on a, on a photograph. This is the same concept but in reverse. I went and painted this initially but I didn't finish all the details, but I did get the neon in. I said, I'll, I'll take this home. I'll paint the rest from the photograph. I got home to paint it, and here's the photograph. You, you have no idea what color that neon was. All right, so we're on to exactly how I would recommend you paint nocturnes. This is a sequence that I've, I use both in the studio and plein air. And the first step will always be composition. Uh, if you are in plein air events, that means you're not using your camera, but you can certainly do thumbnail sketches. You can even work out a composition on your canvas uh, real time, wiping it out if it's not right. But make sure you get that right before you go any further. Once you've decided on a composition, it's time to start drawing in just the major shapes. So by major shapes, I mean that if you are painting buildings, in a downtown setting, paint the outlines of the buildings, try to get proportion correct, height to width, try to get um, perspective right, but don't worry about secondary details. Don't be putting in all the doors and windows, a few major ones perhaps, but nothing more than that. Uh, the next step will be to find your light source locations and take some time to put your light sources in the exact spot you want them on the canvas. I'll talk about that in a second. So here is uh, a scene that I painted in the studio as a demonstration of some of these techniques. And I've, what I've, I did in this scene was I adjusted it so that my light sources, which are going to be the highest contrast areas, are well within my canvas. I think what people uh, often do is they're concentrated on what the scene is and not where the light's coming from. So they'll paint this a little bit too big and then they realize, well, that puts my, my light way up at the edge of the painting and they'll paint it that way. But you're better off moving your light sources in and then shrinking the scene as needed so that you can get the light sources to be anywhere but on the edge of your painting. So here's how it's set up and I did my uh, major drawing or my major shape drawing and you can see 
just really the outlines of these buildings. A, a few major uh, windows, but nothing more. The uh, car is not much more than a little square with a, some tapered edges. So get something down about like this, and then I leave a circle around each of my light sources, and I know I'm going to leave that empty when I start blocking things in. Just to remind me to say that uh, I do pay a lot of attention to perspective and proportion. Sometimes I'll even draw these vanishing point lines. As far as proportion goes, it's no secret that uh, many artists use their paintbrush handle to measure height and width of things. And here's an example of a house during the day. I've already drawn it on my canvas, but I want to recheck and make sure I have that proportion right. So I hold one end of the brush on one edge of the house. I'll put my thumb at the other end. I'll turn my arm 90 degrees, and now I can see that the height of this building is roughly two-thirds as high as it is long. And then I can make sure that I have that on my canvas as well. Then I'll measure, for instance, a car height, and I'll take that car height and put it up against the house and to make, to make sure that I get the car the right size relative to the house. And you can do that for all the major objects, objects in your painting. Sometimes at night, because all of my paintbrushes pretty much have dark handles, I will add a white painted stick to my, uh, my brushes and use this to measure proportion. You can see that in the darkness, obviously. All right, the next step, once you get the drawing done, is to block in and connect your darks. Now, this is a pretty rapid process in a nocturne because there are so many darks. Uh, so it's kind of gratifying to get that much done so quickly. I use roughly correct color, but not the final color because I usually do at least two coats on, for instance, my sky. I, so I use thin paint. I don't want to build up an impasto and I don't want to make it too hard to put paint over paint. Uh, I will always I'll continue to leave gaps where my light sources are because I want to have some clean canvas to lay down a, a really clean, bright uh, light source. So here's the example that I was uh, using of the uh, studio demo. And I've started with this dark block in, in the sky and I'm working my way down. I'm leaving the light areas, the areas for the lights open. As I get down, I see some value changes, so I'll darken that mixture, roughly in the color that I want to end up with, but not the exact color. This is actually put down a little thinner than I, than I put it down. You can see a lot of transparency, but uh, there are, the first layer will be a little more transparent because you're putting it down so thin. I'm also getting some of that dark on the uh, ground plane as well, some of that sky color. So I arbitrarily call this step three, but it's just to remind me to tell you that if you have objects that are going to move in your scene, or you, you know that lights are going to be turned off, try to put those in sooner than later. Here is an example from uh, Laguna Beach. I was painting this marine tavern room, or marine room tavern, and uh, I got the sky in and the light in, and I thought, I better get these cars in. So I put, painted them completely, with just a few exceptions. And within 30 minutes, they were gone, but then I could spend the rest of the time painting the rest of the scene. This was a case of a plein air piece in Telluride, where I was going along just fine painting this at night. And I was about to do the porch, and then all the porch lights and the house lights went off, and the people went to bed. So I came back the next day and uh, finished the porch right away and then finish the rest of the painting. So the next step will be to refine my light sources. So this is when I now uh, work on the halos. I work on a transition from the halo to the sky, so I often repaint the sky, at least in the region of the halos. So here was where I was, and now the next step will be to put another coat on the sky, start building these halos as I discussed in, earlier in the talk. Okay, so you're to that point, and now the next step will be to paint the illuminated areas and refine the drawing in the light areas. 
Always be mindful of the hierarchy of light. So the brightest thing in your painting will be the light source. Everything should be down from that. Even a mirror-like reflection we will be down just a little bit from the light source. Look for value gradations and look for prismatic color gradations on the illuminated areas. And I'll be showing you many examples. And then finally, look for reflected light. So here's where we were. The darks are blocked in, the halos are in place. Normally I would put the impasto bright light source in as well. I didn't in this case, but this would have been a good time to put those in. I haven't really got much of the cast light on the sidewalk yet. I just have a hint of the light on the pavement. So now we start building the painting. We start refining the drawing. You can now see light, cast light on the sidewalk and on the pavement. Notice the transition of value and color on the pavement where just beneath this warm light you'll see a more yellow, brighter color and as you move away from the light it becomes a little more orange and a little bit darker. On the crosswalk markings you can see that it's warmer on the left side because it's affected by this light and it's cooler on the right side because it's affected by this light. You'll see some nice reflected light from this orange neon onto the pavement over here on the right. Another good example of prismatic color shift as value shifts on an illuminated surface, in this case the ground plane. Beneath this light, which has a halo, you'll see the brightest area of the pavement, and it's a more of a yellow color, transitioning darker and now becoming redder, and then darker yet and now picking up sky color. That's the flat plane. You can see the same thing on an, an upright plane as light is cast onto a wall, for instance. You, again, you go from light to dark, but you also go from yellow to orange to red, which is kind of a reddish brown brick building, which is what this was. And there's a little bit of influence by sky color as you get to the outside of the building. This is a photograph of a, a reference we'll be using later in the uh, video. And this shows a kind of a subtle shift of color as as the value shifts to a darker, uh, uh, a darker level. But if you break this off into segments, you can see that the illumination on the grass goes from kind of a yellowy orange to a more, more orangey color, more red, and then finally kind of a violety brownish red. This is a good example. Another, another piece we'll be uh, replicating in the studio for this video but lots of reflected light in this case. You can see obvious reflection of light onto the wall of this building from the neon down below. Cast light onto the sidewalk, which then shifts prismatically to a darker, more uh, orangey color. Reflected light onto the sidewalk and, sidewalk and onto the snow in several areas. So the final step in painting nocturnes I'm including three different points. One is to improve color. It's not uncommon at the end, I may actually repaint the sky one more time just to get perfect, more, not perfect, but to get improved color transitions and value transitions towards the light sources. I look for dark accents that I might have missed. And to me, one of the key areas is putting in these little bright reflections on man-made items or anything that has a reflective surface uh, to show um, a more realistic light effect. Any t I can show you examples of that and it'll make sense. So here is the scene that I, we've been working on and you can tell now that I've refined the color in the sky. There's a nice transition to these halos. If you look at the car, you can see reflected light on the windshield from the blue neon, but you also see these bright reflectors, mirror-like surfaces. These are actually probably light sources across the street. Another example of bright reflectors or reflections in the glass uh, windows of this car, you can see reflection of these white lights over here. And that pulls the car forward in my drawing a little bit but it also adds a little excitement and more, more realism to the scene. So that's the sequence. 
I just want to show you a couple slides from an outdoor painting to show you that I, I used the same sequence then. So this is a plenary piece I did in Door County last year. This was the scene. The first step was to do the drawing. You can see I've already made kind of a stutter step on where I wanted my light source, but I'm able to do that early on in the painting. And I'm trying to get everything positioned where I want it. The next step was to uh, put in my darks and connect them wherever I can. So I got one thin layer in the sky, a little darker area on the upright trees, and I bring that dark right down onto the ground plane wherever I can. I leave a gap for the light source. The next step, I'm starting to refine the halos around the street light and also around the, the more fluorescent light of this sign. Notice I have all three cars completed enough. So uh, they can leave at any time and I can just keep working on the painting. And so this is the final result and you can see now I've completed the illuminated areas, I've refined the sky even further and refined these light sources. A word about painting at dusk. Dusk is a hard time to paint, but the paintings from this period of time are beautiful because there's still some light in the atmosphere. I find it's really difficult to do it um, real time because that period of time from sunset to complete darkness is about 30 minutes and it's hard to complete a painting in 30 minutes. I discovered almost by mistake that an easier way to do it is to go out and paint your painting when it's completely dark and then go back the next day when it's at the, at the brightness that you want to paint at and now just add a little bit of color back into the sky and without changing anything else this makes this almost a convincing dusk painting. I did add a little bit of that more bluish sky color to some of the top planes, but just minor changes. Another example of that, I painted this scene late at night, had no idea where the trees behind the building were, but I went back the next morning and I used the trees as a template to add just a little brightness back into the sky and I think that adds to the interest in this painting. It gives us a couple more shapes. Now some tips. Uh, I already mentioned this, but I use thin paint. If you can figure out some way to use a thin, fast drying paint, I find it very helpful since I'm putting paint over paint later on in the same painting, in the same session. So things that will speed drying, uh, I use turpentine if I'm outside, not in the studio though. In the studio, you can add a Gelkid to your medium. You can add a cobalt dryer, something like that, at least for your first few coats or your first coat. I use a lightly toned panel. Uh, I did try a dark panel a couple of times, and I found that in order to see what I was doing, I had to use light paint to do my drawing, and then that light paint would contaminate my darks later on. So, what I do now is just a lightly toned panel and I draw in dark paint. Try to avoid using white in your mixtures. There are times you'll have to use it. I certainly use it for my light sources and some of the grayer areas in my painting. But uh, in general, if you have too much white in your mixtures, then things do look too gray. And nocturnes, one nice thing about them is you can get very chromatic light effects, which are nice. Uh, if you paint outside with a light, which you pretty much have to, um, you should have your light setting fairly low when you start. When I first started doing nocturnes, I had my light setting too bright and too warm, and I would get the, I would get the painting back inside and it would be painted way too dark and way too cool. So now I, I turn my light uh, intensity down and I set it to a cooler setting if I have that option. At the end of your painting, you can turn the light back up again just to make sure you're not making any major uh, color errors. Always pay attention again to the hierarchy of light. Try to identify the light sources outside even before you paint them so you know what's affecting what in your painting. This is an early version of the light that I use. It's by artescape.us and this is very portable, very sturdy.
and it adjusts between warm and cool and color intensity or light intensity. Additional tips, dress warm. Painting at night is certainly different during, than during the day. It's much colder than you think. If you paint along a roadside, uh, it's a good idea to bring some kind of a, a warning device like an orange cone or a reflector. I had a case uh, a painting last year I was doing on the side of the road and the police came, up, came over and they told me I had to have my flashers on or some kind of a warning sign next to my, my painting easel. Doesn't hurt to bring an extra flashlight or headlamp with you. Uh, there's times when I'm putting away my uh, more elaborate nocturne light and I have a hard time because I can't see it. So now I bring a headlamp with me and I'll put that on as I put my other light away. I think it goes without saying you should avoid isolation whenever you can. I like to paint with people at night. If you can't, it pays to try to find an area that's fairly populated so that no one bothers you. Or I shouldn't say no one bothers you, but you don't have to fear for someone bothering you. So one thing that came up a couple years ago, I, I now tell neighbors or businesses that I'm going to paint outside their, their home or their business at night just so they're not alarmed at night. Everything scare, seems scarier to people at night. So I was, I was doing this painting in a suburb of Boston a few years ago. And I, in a period of two and a half hours, I had four police cars stop, each of them telling me that the neighbors were worried about what I was doing and they were wondering what I was doing, but it all turned out. A couple more tips. Atmospheric perspective is something that we all learn in plein air painting landscapes where shadows, as they move off into the distance, lose color, become uh, lighter and bluer. That's because there's illumination of the atmosphere between you and those shadows. At night, however, without illumination of the atmosphere, those distant shadows may be the same value as the foreground shadows. The lights, however, will show atmospheric perspective. They'll become dimmer and lose yellow as they go off into the distance. Here's a dusk painting. There's still enough light in the atmosphere that I do get some atmospheric perspective in this case with the distant uh, trees lighter than these foreground trees. Lost and found edges are kind of the hallmark of uh, plein air paintings at night. You're going to find them everywhere. Just one quick example, an obvious uh, sharp edge near the light source, a soft edge away from the light source, and in the shadow, you completely lose edges. So a real variety of edges. So now I'm going to summarize the technique that I use for painting nocturnes. It starts with a composition. I draw in the major shapes, paying attention to proportion and perspective. I'll block in all the darks using, using thin paint. And now movable objects and lights that'll be turned off, try to put those in earlier than later. The next step then is to refine the light sources and repaint the sky as needed. And then you're on to the, the substance of the painting, which is putting these illuminated surfaces in, looking for a hierarchy of light, color and value transitions, reflected light, and at the same time refining your drawing and your color. And then the final step, one last look at your color decisions and improving color wherever you can. I may paint this guy over again at this, at this step. Look for dark accents that you might have missed, like uh, under wheel wells, anywhere where there's no light getting to an area. And then look for these really bright reflections that uh, make your painting look more real. Okay, let's go on to the demonstration parts of the video. Uh, so now I'm going to go through my palette and some of the equipment that I typically use. So I guess I always start <laughs> with my glove. Uh, I usually wear a nitrile glove on my left hand and I'll tell you why. Because I'm always holding a paper towel in my left hand. And as I clean my brush, I get 
I'd get paint all over my hand if I didn't have a glove, so that's why I do that. And I also like to have it on when I'm putting my paint out because I always get little bits of paint on my fingers as I try to open these uh, lids or caps and put them back on. All right, so this is my palette. Uh, as I mentioned in the PowerPoint, this is a, a prismatically arranged palette, so I'm going to start with a white. I'll tell you, there's a couple colors that I want specific pigments for, but in general, uh, almost any manufacturer would produce something that I think I could paint with. I'm going to start with a titanium white, and this happens to be Gamblin, but I'll use any titanium white. Now this is one specific color that I like, and that's a Cad Yellow by Old Holland. And the reason is that I can mix this with ultramarine to make a nice neutral green. This was taught to me by Joe Paquette, but it's become very useful. Uh, and it also tints out a, with a little less white in it than other cad yellow lights. So I like the intensity of this cad yellow light. So cadmium yellow. Uh, I use cadmium yellow, scarlet, and red, all from Winsor Newton. And I, I do like these specific uh, colors by this manufacturer just because I've used it so long that I know how the mixtures will look with these colors. Seems, uh, it seems like there are so many different versions of cadmium orange, so I know what this orange looks like over time. Cadmium scarlet, you can also think of this as uh, cad red light. Typically I put out less cadmium colors than I do my darker pigments. I find I use a lot more of the darker pigments, particularly at night. So um, I'm pretty sparing with the use of these cadmiums, plus they're pretty expensive, so that works out. So those are the cadmiums, and now alizarin permanent. You can just use alizarin as well. This is a gambling alizarin. Again, I'm not sure that the manufacturer would matter that much for that pigment. Now this is one of the specific colors. This is Old Holland Manganese Blue Extra. They used to make a manganese blue that they don't make anymore. Instead they make what's called Extra, but it looks the same to me. And uh, this is a lighter version of a blue. And I use it often during the day to paint the lower part of a sky, which seems to have a little more warmth and a little lighter uh, color in it than the top, top of the sky, part of the gradation. Uh, and I'm going to go down to use uh, to, to darker blues. This will be cobalt blue. And the color I use the most of, probably, for nocturnes is uh, French ultramarine blue, which is a dark blue. Probably a little bit of red in this. So I'm going to put that down. And now, this will be controversial for some painters, but I use a little black. And uh, I find that at night, I've learned over time not to have straight blues in my sky at night, even though it looks very blue sometimes. And I like to dull it down either with black or an earth color or a mixture of cadmiums and darker colors. But uh, black is sometimes used in that. Specialty color is thalo green, and no matter, if you're going to paint at night, you should have some dark green pigment, either thalo green or viridian. And I have gotten used to thalo green over time. But the nice thing about it is if I want to mix green into a dark at night, um, if I were to mix a green, I'd have to put yellow in it, which is lighter and the value is uh, brighter. And it kind of messes with the, my value structure. So I want a dark green, so I'll use thalo. I usually use one earth color, again, to dull out solo colors like the blue in the sky. Um, I don't use a lot of it, but it's, it's a nice color to knock something down with at night. And that's that. And now the other thing that I do is I mix a violet. This is another Joe Paquette thing. Uh, I mix five parts ultramarine and one part alizarin crimson or alizarin permanent. 
and I just eyeball that. And then I will mix that into a violet. A lot of people mix with a palette knife, but I find I get such a big pile if I do that. So I just use the end of a brush and just do a little, little twirls. And it's surprising how well that actually mixes. And I'm going to leave a little of that out in my palette because I, my, the first thing I'm going to show you is something with a dark pigment in it. So I'll just leave that to use. And I guess that's it. There's a couple of additions uh, for a specific painting once in a while. That'll, there'll be a color that'll be hard to get to. And one such color in the painting I'm going to be doing soon is a real pinky uh, red. And so I've got a Michael Harding magenta. I'm just going to put that down. And one more specialty color is King's Blue. And I find that I can lighten a dark violet sky with King's Blue and not have to specifically add white to it. So I'll put that down. It's also helpful during the day if you do day, day scenes. Okay, that's my palette. Uh, let's talk about brushes. I, I will use any kind of brush I can find. I certainly have uh, many fan manufacturers whose brushes I do like, uh, but I want to talk to you more about the types of brushes. So I've got, a, I brush, I, I use primarily uh, hog hair brushes, bristles, and more recently some of the synthetics that act like bristle brushes. I've got a mixture of sizes from a 1 all the way up to probably a 10. But then I also have uh, this soft synthetic 1.5 inch brush that I find very helpful for nocturnes, for doing uh, halos around lights and so forth. And if I want to knock down edges, this is a very handy brush. If you don't have that, or if I'm doing a smaller area, any sable or um, badger type hair brush would be good, very soft brush. And so that's it. So why don't we get started? Okay, we're ready to start the, uh, the demo now. And this will be a little bit more complex of a demo in that there will be multiple light sources and there'll be lots of illuminated surfaces. So uh, consequently, this will be kind of drawing intensive initially, uh, but you'll notice that the sequence should end up the same. So I'm going to get started with the drawing. My resource uh, for, drawing, for drawing this is going to be from this photograph, but I've also done the same painting from life, and I'm going to use the life painting for a lot of the color decisions that I make. So let's get started. Uh, when I draw, I've told you that I, always use, I usually use a toned, light-colored panel, and I draw with dark paint. doesn't matter what dark paint you use as long as it's a color that's going to be in your darks later. So I'll just start with something kind of violet-y. Um, try to avoid putting white in your, your pigment to start with. So I'm just going to use violet and brown. And I'm using straight turpentine at this point. Um, what I'm going to do is, this is kind of an elongated uh, image compared to what my panel size is. This panel is about an inch taller than that image. So what I'm going to do is right now I'm going to cut off about an inch along the top and maybe a half inch on the bottom and I'm going to put that image in what's left. Okay, so you can see my crosshairs are going to move now a little bit. So the middle of my painting will now be here and then what I'll do at the end is I'm just going to add a little more sky and a little more ground plane but in order to keep things in proportion, I need to uh, cut my, my panel off like this. So now I'm going to start my drawing uh, on the inner part of, this, uh, of these lines. So this all, automatically this top of the building will start about there. Uh, not in the midline though. 
I think it's going to be important to establish a uh, horizon line right away. So let's try to get that and that'll be where the uh, road ends on the left side of this image. And I'm going to imagine that that, I'm going to use my measuring device. It's about uh, a third of the way up. So that would be a bit low, so I'll put it about right here. We'll make that my horizon line. I'm going to take this midline line out, but this is the close edge of the building to me. And I'm going to go ahead and put the far edge in. And I'm going to connect those two to a vanishing point down here. And if you look at the image, the vanishing point ends up being somewhere near this, this side of the roadway. Let's say that's the vanishing point. I, sometimes I'll even just go ahead and, and draw radiating lines from the vanishing point. And that gives me an idea where everything's going to converge to in space. This is the sidewalk down on the right side of the image. And that is even going to go to here. Okay, and this roadway, if I measure the snow pile from the side of the road, it's about a third of the way over. Let's measure that. Somewhere around there. And that too should go to the vanishing point. There's a car sitting in here. And then there is, I'm standing straight behind the car in this case. And so this mark on the pavement is actually angled the other way towards the vanishing point. Okay, so that's roughly where everything's going to be converging. Now I told you that I like two-point perspective for buildings. Uh, I'm not going to use this top angle of the main building because it's, it's already at an angle, but instead I'll use the square building down below it to find a vanishing point going the other direction. So I'm trying to uh, then locate the position of this corner of the lower building. And that looks to be about a fourth of the way. Let's see, almost a fourth. I'll put it right there. I'm gonna take that back a little bit. This is the time to make changes. All right, so this building, this roof line is going away from me. It's above me, so it's going to slope down a little bit. But I'm going to pretend that the vanishing point is way out there and just pull it down from, from horizontal just a little bit. There we go. Now this building I know that if this was a square building on top that I would probably aim towards the same vanishing point like so, but it's a sloped uh, top to this building, so I'm going to slope it down right now. And let me take a look at that. Too much. Okay. I'm going to try to put in the 
drawing of the sidewalk right now. And this will be the, the uh, snow pile right here. And the sidewalk starts about right there. So one more line to the vanishing point right here. Now I'll be able to paint right over those lines later, so I'm not too worried about them. The uh, canopy of the building is a pretty major piece of this image. So I'm going to put that in next. And it's fair, it's just above eye level a little bit, so it's going to slope downward towards that vanishing line on the right. And it looks like about half of the canopy sits out beyond the building and the other half superimposed over the building. And actually the canopy comes off of this small, the second smaller building over here. So let's put that line down like so. The space then to the right, it's a window. And I told you that when you do the major drawing, the major shapes to avoid windows on buildings, if you have a window that takes up the whole side of the building, certainly put it in. So that's what this one is. Now, the whole reason I picked this scene was for that neon sign. So I'm going to take some time to make sure I get that in the right position. Okay, quick lesson on perspective. If you want to find the midline of this wall, which is going away from me in perspective, you would take diagonals from the corners, and they usually intersect where the midline should be. And in this case, that pulls the midline to the left. So that's where that sign will start from. And it doesn't stick out as far as the canopy. And now I've got about a, the, the height of the sign, if I take that and make it just slightly over the width of the sign, that gets me to the top of the building. So I want to make sure I get that. So here's the width of the sign, a little past it. So here's the top of the building. So I'm going to cut that off a little bit. That means I'll cut this off a little. And let's measure the canopy relative to the sign. It's just a little bit wider than the sign. Now, there's a doorway right here. It goes down to the bottom of the building, although there actually is a little step in here. But that is, if I go horizontal to that, that gets me to the street and there's some light in here. So it will be an important line to remember. And it's, if I could point it out, it'd be right where you see the light coming away from the doorway on the pavement towards the street. That'll be that. And then down below that level, actually right at that level is the car. So I'm gonna put the car right there. Now I want to make sure that I have the car proper, in proper proportion to the building. And remember I told you you can use your, your uh, brush handle to do that as well. So if I go from the doorway up, one, two, four and a half car heights to the top of that building. Let's see how I did. One, two, three, four. Five. So I'm off. So that means if I want to keep the building as it is, I've got to make that car a little taller. Now we'll try it. And this all seems kind of slow right now, but this will save you so much time later. So that's four and a half. So that's about right. So that's how I get relativity in proportion. 
And these are all still pretty major shapes. Now, there's a building in the background that is very near the value of the sky. And there's an unfortunate tangent there. If you see the top of this building, it lines up with the top of the canopy. So I'm going to fudge that a little bit so that you can separate those visually. So I'm going to move the height of the building actually down a little bit relative to that canopy. And the edge of the building comes down pretty much in line with that car. There's a little bit of a, the side of the building showing. I, I use that perspective line to keep it in perspective. And now you can see that other building showing through. Uh, the bottom of that building, there's a road coming through about here. And there's kind of an elevated parking area right here that comes straight across. And that forms a little triangle right here. So that's a sh major shape. Try to find major shapes in your drawing. So at this point, I have got close to most of the shapes in place. I'm going to add one more thing. That's the wall right here. Keep it in perspective. And there's a tree in place. I'm going to go ahead and put that in right now. Now there's one thing that's not in this painting, but I'll be adding it. This building has decorative lights on this side, on this wall. It's a little string of lights that goes like so. And there's little lights along it. And I like the idea of putting that in because it'll balance out all the light on this side of the, the image. So there's one more car that I want to get in position. And that's the car out more in the middle of the road. And I'll just put that in relative to its position with the other car. And think of cars as boxes. They're really just boxes. Little shadow area there that I think is really cool. Now, there's a, a valet stand. I'm going to put that in. It's one more major shape. And it is right here. The valet stand top is roughly at eye level, so you won't see much angle difference between these two sides, and there'll be snow on top of that. I put a figure in here also, and again, to balance out all the action on this side of the painting. So I thought this required a figure. I had a friend stand in my studio in the position I wanted him in, and I'm just going to just remind myself to put that in. Just going to correct one shape, that tree. I wanted to have it a little further to the side. There we go. All right, uh, so the title of this painting was Monte Carlo fire pit. So I'm going to make sure I get the fire pit in there, which is right here. And then there's some bench seating around that. Sure, I got proportions right. I think I'll measure it off the car. It's in the foreground, so it's a little bigger than I had imagined it. Okay. I'm going to put in the sign, is a pretty major portion of this. I'm going to go ahead and draw it quickly in perspective. This line should 
be parallel to that line and perpendicular to this line. Okay. All right, now it's time to put down any light sources that are, I consider major light sources. And one major light source, of course, will be the neon. That'll be the major light source. But it may not be the brightest. There'll be another light source where the fire pit is. There's multiple light sources back here, and I'm not going to paint them all. I'm going to judiciously pick which ones I want to paint. And in fact, I think I might change one of them. So if you see, the, there's some low street lights along this boulevard. And there's one right here that is superimposed over the building, roughly at the level of the canopy. And there's another one next to it right here. I'm going to make the one next to it a street light that's even taller because I want to get some light up into this big empty spot. So I'm going to just make a judicious uh, alteration here and put that light up higher. And that'll be a street light. And then the, I like the green lights in this painting because there's so much red in the painting. So I'm going to make sure the street lights are green. And I'll put one green street light here. And then over here is a second street light. And there's a third, pretty much in line with this, or not street light, stop light. There's another stop light in line with this street light, just a little to the inside and a little lower than the first. I'll put that right there. So one, two, three, four, five lights over on this side, two main lights over here. There is light back here, but I'm going to count this as illuminated area. You don't see the light source. You just see the effect of the light on that building and a little green light back in this courtyard you see. So that's enough right now for the drawing, for putting in the light source locations and composition. Okay, so I have the drawing done. I've concerned myself with perspective and proportion, and I'm ready to start blocking in the darks. So I'm going to start with that sky. Um, it's easy to just put all my dark pigments together. I would get a very blacky color, and I want it just a little more luminous than that. So I'll take those dark pigments, let's say ultramarine, violet, maybe a little bit of earth color, so I'll use my brown matter. And I'm just going to add the slightest amount of this king's blue, just to lighten everything a little bit. I'll add a little bit of cobalt also. And let's see what kind of color I get. So it's still very dark, right? And I'd say, if anything, this, that sky tends towards a reddish color. I'm going to put a little more alizarin in. And very thin paint, I'm going to use Gamzol to thin it with. And I'm going to just start putting down my first layer of paint. All right, so you can see as, it, as I put it down and it's just a little transparent, that it's not as dark as I can go. So I've added just a little luminosity to that dark sky. And you can have fun and be a little messy right here because it all gets covered up later. Now, at this point, I have, I'd have a hard time telling you exactly which colors I'm using. All I know is what I want to end up with. I want to end up with something like this. I want to know that it's kind of a violety sky, but not pure violet. And at this point, these block ins, not only does it get some paint down, but it actually helps you draw. You can start cutting into things a little bit uh, on the horizon and, and show a little bit of the form that's underneath it. So what happens now, for instance, I'll get down near this building, and as I do, I'll add a little more red. And I'm going to cut back and try to get the exact angle of this building. You can see how fast this goes. Now, 
Now this is a big area of not much going on, but even that area will become a little more interesting because there'll be some good light prismatic transitions in that. If I had left it all one color, it could be pretty dull. Now as I get to the bottom on the left, it's starting to look a little cooler to me, that sky. So I'm going to go with some cobalt and maybe add just a little bit of my uh, phthalo green. And just keep coming down. You see the difference now? Now remember, I'm going to leave openings for those light sources. Any really small light sources, or like there's some lights in these windows over here, you can leave that towards the end. You can always put in little halos as needed by just painting them more directly into the scene. Again, you see how I can cut back to try to improve these shapes as I go. And especially right here where I have that the unfortunate tangent that I'm trying to change, I want to make sure I get a definite break in that. And that's good right there. Now as I get to the sky around this light, remember that's a, a light source and it's going to project a halo. I'm going to start putting in some of that halo color now. More than anything, it reminds me to do an accurate halo later. But it'll serve as a rough halo right now. This is some of that magenta that I'm using just because I know this ends up being a real pinky color. You could do it with alizarin, it's just a little easier with this color. And I'm going to put a little bit of that under the sign, but because there's yellow on the bottom of that neon, sometimes the, it isn't quite as red as the top of that sign. Now I'm going to just step back. Make sure that's roughly what I was thinking, and it is. All right, so now I'm still blocking in darks. I'm going to try to find some of that sky color on the ground plane. And for sure, you can start with that color and maybe add just a little bit to it. So let's go ahead and mix that color one more time. A lot of blues, a little bit of brown, just a little bit of this king's blue. Little alizarin. All right, and so the sidewalk is definitely dark. Darker in the foreground than in the background. And here's where I can do some drawing. Okay. The same thing with the road, but because there's taillights shining on the road and causing halos, I'm going to make this a darker, redder look by adding more alizarin, maybe even a little red. And something like that. Wherever else I can get some darks on the road, I'll do it. I think back here. And you can use a little transparency sometimes if something is almost dark, but 
kind of in between, illuminated and dark. Another example of that might be the side plane of this snow pile. Looks like there's a pretty good area of dirty, dark snow right there, and it climbs up into the side of the snow pile. Okay, let's go to the windows. The one in the distance over here looks a little more, a little cooler. So I just can mix some blues with that sky color. Or with that violet -y color, rather. get the uh, doorway. I'm going to move things over just a little. And then the set of windows on the right side. I'm going to draw the shadow side of this building. This building, there's a green light in that courtyard, so I'm going to take that sky color and add a little green to it, maybe just a little bit of King's Blue. Thin it only with turpentine. There's the wall down below right here. There's some red in the, the uh, fire pit. I'm going to add a little red to that. Most of that is going to be from halo around that light source, which is the fire itself, but it's distinctly warmer than the rest of the area around it, so I'll make it red. And then it looks like a little darker color underneath these cushions and uh, chairs. And then outlining the edge of that valet stand. There is a bush on the side of the building. First of all, the side of the building has a little light on it, so I'm just going to make sure I maintain that. And then there's a bush right here. And there's a shadow. That extends like so. And then there's an another shadow right here. And again, that illuminated part of the sidewalk from where the stairs are. This little triangular shape I mentioned back here earlier, I'm going to go ahead and make that a dark. It's mostly dark. There's a green light back there, so I'm going to make sure I get the phthalo into this dark mixture for the, this little back triangle. All right, there's still more darks to go. I'm going to do the tree next. That is an orangey green tree because it's a green tree with that's partly dead but also getting some warm light on it. And don't worry at this stage if it doesn't look beautiful yet because this is your block in. And don't panic. It gets better.
you can see how with these nocturnes, you can cover a lot of area quickly. If I had to be careful about each color of grass and everything else on a full-size outdoor daytime painting, this would be going a lot slower. All right, there's a building in the back. I'm going to paint that next. Definitely a warmer color, but pretty similar in value to the sky. I'm going to go with a little bit of phthalo and brown together, leaving those sky hole, or leaving those uh, openings for my light sources back there. I think it's going to end up being lighter than that. I'm going to add a little orange right now. And I see a little bit of that building underneath the canopy. Now at this point, I'm going to do a little wipeout. I think I have the height of this little triangle just a little high. I'm going to take a little bit of that out. Easily done at this stage. And what you see remaining is where the lights through the windows are going to be shown showing. I'm going to um, just leave those as blank canvas for now. So I lost one of the light positions, one of the green lights. I just want to reinforce that so I don't lose it later. I'll just scratch that in. Okay. All right, let's get to the car. Typically, the car is going to be a dark silhouette most of the time. In this case, because of those red lights, the brake lights on, I'm going to make it even redder than I normally would because it'll be all caught up in the halo of those taillights. The main thing to worry about right now is proportion of that car. Okay, and there's a little shadow out to the side. There's a little sidewalk right here. Now, right uh, where this canopy ends, there are a couple of poles coming down. They're too small to worry about putting in right now, but I want to put them down so I know where to put. There's a couple of planters with trees in them. I want to get those in position. Okay, so I think you're starting to see the painting take shape just by putting these darks in. There's another car out here, as I had mentioned. The tendency is always to make cars a little too high for their width. So at this point, I know I do it a lot, so I, I do a lot of measuring, but I also purposely try to make them a little bit wider than tall if I can. I think that's getting pretty close. There's a lot of light back here so that this does read mostly as a, a light, but I mean, let's put in a small scrub of some warm stuff just so I remember that there's a little shadow where that snow pile is heaped up. 
And you can just kind of put something down and wipe it out and you'll remember that. Now this building, I'm not sure I want to put it in. I'm just going to just put, a, again, a little bit of a washi thing in over here and I can decide later if, that, if I should put that in or not. A little bit of light above both of those cars. Now I use, I often use the end of my brush as a drawing tool and I'm going to put in some top planes that I think are important. Here's the fire. I want to kind of redraw this um, valet stand, make sure it's in the right spot, which is right here. I think it comes down further, so I'll just redraw it. Get a little bigger. And then there's a snow drift on this side. I'm going to just try to create a nice pattern that isn't just a straight line. Similarly, there's a pile of snow here. It starts a little lower. I'll put it right there. Now, I don't have to put all the detail in. There's some windows back here and so forth. I think for now, I'll leave those out. And I think we're getting pretty close to putting in our lights as we refine the sky. Let's just see if there's any other darks that I really want to get in right now. Not really. I'll put the figures in at the very end. I think figures are more easily painted over the top. Uh, you'll see that soon. Okay, so at this point, I've got my darks primarily blocked in. And the next step in my sequence would be to go ahead and paint the light sources themselves, including the halos, and at the same time, repaint my sky. I analyze pretty carefully what colors I finally want in my sky. And, but a lot of that will be dictated by the halo itself. So let's go ahead and start by painting the halos. I'm going to paint a halo around the neon. I'll paint a halo around these five lights and around the fire. I'll also paint halos around these tail lights, which are actually quite bright. I'm just going to make an indication of where those are. And because I want a halo with some brightness to them, I'm going to actually do a little wipe out where those taillights are. Similarly on this car. All right, that all makes sense so far. Let's go ahead. So I think, I think I'm going to start with the, the main light, which is the halo around the Monte Carlo sign. Again, most of that neon is orange and red, so I'm going to paint it as though it's an orangish reddish light. So that means by the time I start my halo, I want to prismatically shift to pretty much straight red. So I'm going to start my halo with red. Now just outline that sign. Most of that halo is above the sign because there's more red at the top of the sign. And down below it, it gets a little darker and maybe just a little more towards the yellow spectrum. So I'm going to add some orange to the lower part. Okay. Again, that's just halo underneath the sky color. So now I'm going to go ahead and transition to alizarin. And because I did brighten my sky just a little bit, I'm going to lighten that alizarin a little bit with the orange. Or the red, rather, I should say. And I get off further. I'm going to use that uh, magenta that we talked about and I'm going to mix it with a little bit of violet and put that in. It should still be lighter than the sky, correct? Now 
And the other thing I want to do is not to make the perfect outline of that sign as I get out further. I want it to be more diffuse. So if it was round, I'll make it square. If it was square, I'll make it round, for instance. It'll look something like that. So that color is fine for the halo. Um, I'm going to paint over that now with sky color before I blend it. Um, at this point, when I first put in my, my sky color, I used a pretty firm brush that I could scrub a little bit. Now I'm laying paint on paint, so I want a softer brush. I happen to have a, a hog bristle brush that's relatively soft. It's a long flat, so I'm going to use that and see how I do. I like a, a bristle whenever I can because I can pick up paint more easily with it. All right, so pick a sky color again. I'm going to use every color I already have on this palette on my mixing surface. I'm going to add some violet to that. A little bit of blue. A little bit more alizarin. Just a touch of my, my uh, king's blue. And I think since I'm going to start over on the right side of the painting, I'm going to make that cooler. I'm going to even put a little bit of manganese in that and start my painting. So I'm going to pause for a minute and add a little bit of medium to my, my mineral spirit. This is a, an elkid with a little bit of walnut oil in it. It'll sh dry a little bit shinier and dry a little bit faster. So I just added that to the Gamsol mixture. Okay, now let's see how it goes. So I'm getting pretty good coverage. And the faster you want this to go, the larger brush you can use. I probably could have used even a larger brush. I'm not afraid to do that. I'm going to switch right now. I have a large soft brush right here. Pretty much anything dark I have, but I want it to be mainly towards the cool. Let's see how that looks. I'm going to stop for a minute. That brush is too soft. I'm going to go back to my bristle brush and just try to use more paint. Yep. Now, if I had to, I could put a third coat on this after it dries a little bit more. Sometimes in the field, you don't have that luxury, but in the studio, you certainly do. And notice that I'm really trying to just kind of lay this paint down instead of brush it on. Otherwise, I'm going to pull up paint. So I use a lot of the flat side of the brush. If you remember from my talk, the final step is to recorrect color if it needs it, and that's a good time to try to perfect this sky even more. That's when I might add a little more brightness to the horizon, actually. I'll try to get some of that now also, though. 
You can see I'm getting the opacity in that sky. Definitely now should be getting a little bit uh, warmer on the left side of this painting. So I'm adding a little more alizarin and magenta to my paint. Remember that will darken it, however, so once I get beyond the very top of the painting, I'm going to start lightening it with a little bit of the King's Blue. Okay, now this is the part to learn from, and that's the, when I get close to that halo. And now I want to make sure I'm not too dark, so I'm going to add a little more King's Blue. Good sky color towards the red just a little bit. Put a little down and see, it's still dark. About where I want it, right there. Now this is a kind of a medium-sized panel. Outdoors from life, you can get a lot more done quicker on a small panel, but we have the luxury in the studio now to, to show you what this is like on a little larger scale. Okay, now I'm really going to cover this with sky color so I can blend that halo. Is it still a halo if it's square? I don't know. You can kind of see how that's working out though. All right, I'm going to blend this side before I finish this side. This is one of the differences between doing a painting with one light source or multiple. When you have multiple, you've got to sometimes do this section in steps like I'm going to do right now. All right, here we go. That's a bit red for a halo. I think that I'm going to just darken that a little bit with sky color. You can see I'm kind of bringing color back in and out by using these brush strokes a certain way. And I think that's going to be okay. Now this is one case where I'm going to paint that sign here <coughs> shortly and we'll see if this is reading as too orangey red. I have the feeling it might be, but for now I think I'm going to just leave it and we'll move on to the other halos. So let's work on the street light. Street light has a yellow cast to it in this image, but I want to make it different than this yellowy street lamp, which is lower. So I'm going to make it a little more whitish yellow. Uh, so that means I'm going to probably make the halo more orangey than red. So I'm going to start with yellow as my first halo color. 
It's in the distance, so I'm going to make it smaller than this light because this one's behind it. So I'll go ahead and put all of that orange within my opening. And now, well, that's that kind of a yellowy color. And I'm going to go scarlety orange. Go a little bit wider with that. And because it's in the distance, I'm not going to have quite as an elaborate of a uh, halo. I'm going to leave it about like that. Maybe add just a little bit of brown around it. And it's interesting too, in this case, that brown will mix with the violet that I had coming from the other side from this halo. So it's kind of a nice transition color. Okay, so there's that halo. I'm going to do one more before I blend and put more sky in. We'll do the one that overlies the building. That is that street lamp that goes uh, quite yellow as far as the light source goes. And I'm going to go ahead and just put some orange down first. Then I'm going to go right to alizarin. Again, not quite as elaborate of a halo because it's further away. And if I reduce all the activity as far as color goes back there, it'll help push that back a little bit. All right. And let's go ahead and put in the green stoplights. And since they're going to be a whitish, greenish, yellow for the light itself, I'm going to just start with pretty much straight phthalo green and probably mix it with a little bit of that king's blue because it's got to be a little lighter than the background uh, sky, which will be lightened slightly at the horizon. So let's go here, put that down, add a little more green now. I'm going to do the same for the one right here. And then there's another one up here. I can actually argue that I wouldn't need to put that one in. I think I won't. I'll just have the two. All right, so now it's time to repaint the sky and then do some blending. I'm going to stick with this color to start with, which was pretty cool. Violet with blue and a little king's blue. And as I come down further, I might add a little bit of green to that near the green lights and a little orange near the orange lights, or brown near the orange lights. There we go. Notice the whole time I've been painting this sky, I've avoided any single color dark. I'm trying to mix multiple colors into it. Even though the differences are very subtle, you can tell if it's not done right. All right, here I go and I'm going to start covering over that light source, or not the light source, the uh, halo. All right, I'm going to keep on going just a little bit. It gets a little cooler towards the bottom, so I'm going to stay a little bit further away from the, the uh, alizarin and violet. And I'm going to lighten it just slightly further. I'm going to paint over this building for now, and I can always pop it back in if I want to at the end.
but I think it might be a little too much going on for this side. Okay, now I'm just going to add a little phthalo green to that sky color at the bottom because it's going to really be affected by those green lights and even paint that back over the phthalo that I have. There's kind of a junctional area between a warm light and a cool light. I'm going to actually combine the two colors together a little bit. And now I think I'm ready to blend again. Now, you could argue that you, you'd like it a little more impressionistic looking and I could leave the halos like that. And I have friends who do that. Um, but I'm teaching you this blended method of making a halo right now, so let's stick with that. Sometimes uh, it helps to switch to a smaller brush for these really small lights. If I can do it with a bigger brush, I will. I'm getting dangerously close to picking up paint which means I probably didn't put enough down to begin with, so I'm just going to add a little bit. Make a few mid-course corrections. There's needs a little more violet right here. And I think this whole halo right here is a little too bright. Again, it's in the distance relative to the neon, which will be my brightest. Okay, that's looking pretty good. I'm going to use this brush just to smooth out some of these areas. It'll also unify some of the sky. Okay, so I'm not too unhappy with that so far. Um, oh, one thing, nocturnes, try to make your last strokes relatively vertical for reasons of preventing glare. Okay, I'm going to start painting the light sources now. So the hardest one will be the neon. Uh, let me just do the simple ones first. We're going to paint the street light and the stop lights and so forth. Let's start with the biggest, which will be the kind of low uh, street lamp, kind of a decorative street lamp. It's got a little more yellow in it than the other lights. So I'll make this a pretty yellowy version of white or light yellow. And I think right now I, I'm just going to experiment with the size, but I'm going to picture this lamp about this big. It'll still push it back a little bit, and I can make this one smaller. So let's go with that. And I like to put this impasto down sideways, if I can. Uh, by doing that, some of that impasto will pick up some, some light and make it even brighter sometimes. I'm just going to trim this edge a little. 
Okay, so there's a street lamp. Now I'm going to do the street light, which is a little cooler. I'll just add some white to that, but I don't... It's actually maybe a hair brighter too. I'm just going to dull it down with just a little green from the mess on my palette. And I want it to read as a different type of light than that one. And smaller. We'll leave it like that. And now we are on to the stoplight. Or I should say the go light. It's green. And I'm just adding white to phthalo, maybe just a little bit of cad yellow light, which is cool but still gives more of an illusion of light. And now these are not that big. I can see now, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a smaller brush so I don't have to trim back on those later. Uh, I've got a real small synthetic that I like to use. I think that would be better. I'm just going to add a little bit of white and yellow to that. Make it a little brighter. So now you're going to see me make another mid-course correction. I think there's a little more phthalo around those uh, green lights. And so I'm just going to add that secondarily. And I think I can do that carefully. I'll just... There we go. And it's little things like this that kind of add to the glow that we think we see around lights. Or we do see. And I like that. It's lighter than the sky, but it's a value jump down from the light source. Okay, I think that's just fine. All right, now we'll do the hard one. Ah, one more easy one. We'll do the, the uh, fire pit. Fire is going to go right in there. Do a little halo. Orange to red. Okay. Just going to add one more color. We'll go to kind of a reddish brown. I'm going to probably paint some light, illuminated light over that, but I want to just get this in place for the fire. All right, that won't look like much yet, but it'll get better. All right, let's go on to the uh, neon. So this neon sign, the upper half is red, the lower half is blue, but with some red lettering in it. Uh, we're going to start with a smaller brush. Again, this is the major part of the painting. And what I'm going to do, if you remember the talk on neon, the neon bulb itself illuminates a thin band underneath it. And I'm going to start by painting the thin band of illumination so that it has a little chance to dry before I lay thicker paint with brighter, the brighter color of the neon tube itself over that. So in this case, the neon tube is going to be a bright orange, maybe even a pinkish orange, and the illuminated part of the sign beneath it will then probably be a scarlet or a scarlety red. Let's just say cad red light. Now, when you put this layer down, it's just like the sky. If you're going to paint over it, start kind of thin. So I'm going to start thin, and I'm going to go ahead and just paint the upper part of that sign 
as though it's all cad red light. And I'd say that comes down to about here. I'm going to be going back into that later, also with some darker, uh, more prismatically shifted uh, alizarin on the edges of that. But for now, I'm going to start with this intermediate tone and color. Around the outside, remember, is going to be yellow. I think I'll go ahead and put that in next. It's yellow bulbs against a sign, and in this case, the sign will read as darker and prismatically shifted from yellow. So I think I can actually start that, that rim of yellow with orange. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a line of orange. Not too thick, because I'm going to build over that with yellow. It ends in a nice arrow, so I want to make sure I get that. Now I'm picking up a little bit of dark paint from my drawing, so I'm just going to wipe it out before I put this brighter paint down. So there's the arrow. So that's the base color for that. Um, now even though the picture shows a pretty distinct blue on that lower section, it's going to be influenced by the orange neon that's going, or the red neon that's going to go over it. So I'm going to actually put down kind of a reddish alizarin All right, so when I paint the lower half of this neon, most of it's blue, but the predominant light there is a red light where it says food. So I'm going to put a base color of a dark red color underneath the lettering for food, and then that'll read as a glow when I put the brighter uh, lettering over it. All right, so the rest of that sign is a kind of a bluish color, and then there's some greenish yellow neon over it. I'm going to go ahead and just take a kind of a medium blue, not too thick. I'll just thin it out just a little bit. So I'll use some cobalt. This will read as the dark section under the food sign and on the bottom of the neon sign. Okay. So already that glow that I put in the sky starts to make a little more sense, right? And I haven't put the bulbs in yet. So at this point, I kind of want this to dry a little. And in the meantime, what I like to do is actually scratch out the lettering of a sign like this. So I have, that serves two purposes. It takes a little of the paint out of the way so it doesn't blend with the bright color that I put down later. But it also is a template for me to, to do the lettering. Okay, I'm going to write the Monte Carlo sign in there. And once I get paint down, you won't even be able to read this, but anyone who knows the landmark will know what it says. And in the meantime, it, it looks real because it's based on something real. Okay. 
So now I know where I'm going with my thin paint once I start adding it. I think at this point, however, I could go ahead and put the yellow bulbs in because they can blend a little bit with what's underneath. So I'm going to take straight cad yellow, mix it with a little bit of white. It's probably equal in brightness to this cad yellow light. And I think that's roughly what I have here. The more color I can get into these tones though, the, the more the impression of light there is, even though the value might be down. So I want to make it just a little yellower than what I have over here in those light sources. And I'm going to go ahead and just start putting these down. I'm going to make that even richer yellow. I think I can just go back over it. Now this has taken a while, but again, this is the focus of my painting, so I'm going to take my time on it a little bit. These fine uh, brush strokes require that I get kind of close to it. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead and paint over the, the other lettering. And this should kind of bring that neon to, to life a little bit. Oh, before I do, one more thing. I'm going to put some dark alizarin on the sign away from the lettering at the top. Remember, this is mounted on a board, which is dark. So I'm going to just go ahead and put that around the edges. I'm going to try not to block you as I put this down. If you notice, it's pretty much the same color. There's a shadow next to this sign on the wall. I'm going to go ahead and put that down. And I'm going to pull a little bit of this color up around these letters, just a little. That will reinforce that appearance of an illuminated band next to the light. Okay. I'm going to try to put the Fine lettering on now. I'm going to go with straight orange and yellow. And maybe just a touch of this magenta to make it a little pinkier orange. And then add some white. I want it to read as probably the same brightness as that yellow. It's going to be hard to do. Uh, maybe add a little cad yellow light as I add a little more white. All right, we're going to go with this and see how it looks.
Looks a little dull to me. I'm going to just see what straight uh, orange and yellow would look like. Yeah, I like that a lot better. So that's what it'll be. So I'm trying to put in something roughly the size of those letters and roughly in the shape of them, but they don't have to be exact. Notice I'm dipping back into my paints almost every letter, almost every stroke. And this would be a very painful way to paint if you had to paint like this all the time, but for a few letters, you can do it. Okay. That's it. Now, let's do the food sign, which is more red I'm just going to go with straight uh, cad red light mixed with that other color that I just used. It'll look like a different color neon, but it's going to have this relative same brightness. Again, don't worry about getting the exact letter down, just get the right size. Okay. Now I'm going to just stand back and look at that for a minute. One thing I think uh, I have going on is I've got the yellow around the light a little too white. I want to see that look a little more uh, like yellow straight out of the tube, so I'm going to go ahead and just do that. It'll blend a little bit with what's there. So at some point you're going to say, well, that doesn't look that luminous yet. But what will really make a difference is when I start getting color on the building and on things that it illuminates. So the glow isn't completed yet until I get the rest of that in. Uh, there's one more section of that sign, and that is the kind of a whitish phthalo-y circle. And let's just put that in like that. So I got some phthalo here. I'll add a little cad yellow light to that. A little white. A little bit of medium. And the circle.
So I got that a little bit thick and I can easily cut that back. I just go back to this something kind of in between the blue and that phthalo that I had and I'll put that back in. Okay, one more light source, and that is the fire itself. Now this is a small enough light source, I could have painted this at the end. I'm gonna go ahead and put something in there just as a place saver right now. I'm gonna go with a yellowy white mixture. I'm gonna look at what I actually put on my plein air piece because I thought that was a little bit real, more realistic as far as color. And to complete that halo, I'm going to just take a little more of that red color and start putting it underneath. And that'll be transitioning to an alizarin and finally a kind of a violety dark. Okay, now until I cement that to the ground with a shadow, it's going to float a little bit, but let's just do that. All right, a couple more lights. Let's go with the lights on the car. These will be halos first. I'm going to go right with the alizarin. I'm going to actually work these halos from the outside in in this case. You can do it either way. Smaller ones are often easier to do this way. Okay, and then I'm going to go to red. Again, I'm working outside in. And these won't require quite as much of a blend as when you're looking at light up into the sky. but I will put some blend in them. Let's do that with this smaller big brush. And then we'll put the final impasto down. I'm gonna go with Scarlet with just a little bit of yellow-orange in it. And it looks like at some point I'm going to probably need to brighten that up just a little. Yep. One more. Second car. I want it to read to be uh, to be in the distance relative to that foreground car. So this uh, color I'm putting in the middle of the headlight or the tail light won't be quite as bright as that other one. Okay, I think that covers most of the lights other than some really small ones. So that completes this section. 
Uh, and from here, we'll be working on the illuminated portions of the subject, and we'll also be adding some final smaller uh, light sources. At this point, um, I want to start with the illuminated portions, and I think in keeping with my initial notion, which was to make this the center point, I'm going to start here and work out. So I'm going to work with the, uh, this side of the building and try to get that glow on the building, which is illumination from the sign. Before I do that, there's just a couple little things I want to touch up on that sign. And that is the, the margins of it look a little lumpy and it's a nice straight sign. So I'm going to take a, a color which would have been my, my glow, my uh, halo, and try to just trim away a little bit at that. Yeah, I think that reads better. We're going to do the same thing on the bottom. And also, I'm going to take a green and also trim up here. No, I just got lazy and I put a little bit of a mixture of color in the middle of the O on the food sign and that's really got to be red and I, it pays to just clean your brush once in a while. So I'm going to just change that. No one would see it, but you would. Okay. All right, now I'm ready. Let's start on that building. So the important thing to note is that the value of this, this front of this building is way down from the value of that sign and way down from the value of these lights. So make sure in my first mixture that I get a value that's much lower. It's obviously going to be kind of a pinky orange color on that building and it works to just go ahead and mix uh, a color to go over the whole thing and then go back in and try to get gradations where you see them. So I'm going to take that, I told you I, I added this um, magenta for a reason, it's for this side of the building, and I'm going to add to that a little bit of orange and a little bit of yellow. Let me just see what kind of color I get here. Definitely down from the, the writing on the sign. I think it's going to be easiest to put those windows in if I put those in first. So I'm going to, because they're illuminated, they're not going to be as dark as sky, but there's definitely some darkness in them. I'm going to pick a color or a value in between. I'm going to take kind of a reddish alizarin violet and try to put those windows in first. They start at about the middle of that sign and they go roughly halfway up that wall to about there. So there's one bank of windows positioned. The other bank is even less well seen because of the angle that I'm seeing it at and the light that's hitting it. So I'm going to draw that one in with lighter paint. And I might just make that a solid block. I think I'll do that. I'm going to use that same color and value for the rest of this window, which gets a little lighter other than a few verticals.
At the top, there's a, a band of kind of a violet color uh, piece of trim, and I'm going to put that in and in perspective. That's a bit dark. I'm going to just add a little bit of the King's Blue to that. Definitely should be lighter than the sky, so I think what I'll do is actually scrape that out because the dark paint that I put down initially keeps coming through. It's, paint is transparent, remember. So now I'm going to paint light color over that, and now I get a better, better color, better value. There's a little of that up here as well. And there's a midline shadow that has roughly that color. Remember, the midline, because it's in perspective, is over to the side of this, this square. And that's going to sit somewhere like that. Uh, never waste an opportunity to use the same color. If you see it somewhere else, there's a piece of trim down here. Put that in. And I think it's even the same color as on the front of the awning. So I'll put that in. All right. Now I feel better about putting in the uh, putting in the rest of the wall color. Just want to re reinforce some darks right here. And then that same color I'm seeing in the shadow, it gets darker as it comes down. Okay. Let's go ahead and start putting in the wall color. I'm going to take a new brush. This is the paint I already had started. I'm going to add a little white to that, just pinking it up a little bit. Is that a verb, pinking? Not a bad starting point. Something to paint, paint into. I'm going to add a little more of that pink. Yep. So this vertical I'm just putting in, this is one of the major verticals in the painting. So I want to make sure that I'm not angling it. I want to make sure it's vertical. Everyone has a little bit of astigmatism or uh, they see things a little bit askew. I always tilt things this way. So I want to make sure that I didn't make that mistake and I kind of guess I did. So I'm going to come back a little bit this way. And again, there's a transition here that I will get in later, but I'm going to just get something down first. At the top of that building, it becomes much darker. I'm going to just add a little sky color to that. And I don't really see that shadow as well up here. I'm just going to kind of paint over it. So consider that a base color. 
And as I work into that, we'll be putting some yellows and oranges back into that. A little bit of that pinky color comes through right here and on this side of the building. And then it fades to darkness down there. I'm just going to go back and add a little violet. So now I'm going to start looking at prismatic gradations and reflected light. And I can see that there's more yellow down here. And it stays pink out here, but becomes more orangey red up here. And a little bit orangey over here. So I'm going to take a softer brush and start adding some of those color variations. And paint wet into wet. So I'm going to start with a little bit of orange yellow. I'll mix it right into that color. That way I can gauge what I'm doing to the value as well. Definitely is a little lighter over here. I'm going to make it a little bit more yellow. All right, happy with that. Now a little more orange up here. Let me take my orange. I'll add it to that same yellow orange pile. I want it on the orange side, but not as yellow as what I had here. And notice it's still staying darker than the lettering on that sign, right? All right, there's a little orange coming through right here next to the awning. But it's mostly kind of a shadowy orange. I might prismatically shift that just a little to the red. That's in the shadow. I've got to get a little color back up into the very top piece of that, but it's prismatically shifted and darker. I'm going to go to a kind of a reddish orange. So at this point, the trim I put in and the shadow all look a little too purpley to me. So I'm going to start adding some of the same color back into those shadows at a similar value. So this one I had to add a little alizarin to. Okay, I'm going to use the same color here. There's just a little bit of wall showing next to that shadow all the way down. You have a nice little chiseled brush that works well for this. Chiseled, I mean a nice squared off sharp edge.
Now I'm going to try to make the windows look like they go together by adding a little more of the reddish orange over to this side. Trim that back a little bit. Okay. Now, I often will go back later and even work on this glow more. But everything gets easier the more I get other things filled in. So this will be fine to stop at right now. And let's move on. Let's just keep going, although I don't want to leave any white if I can help it. During the day, I will often leave little white flecks here and there, and they work well to for people to imagine that they're little glistening areas of light. But at night, I don't, when I paint these night paintings, I don't leave empty space very often, especially if my panel's not toned very darkly. Okay, um, let's do the canopy. I think that's the next thing that catches my eye. That's primarily a dark, of course but there's white stripes, so I've got to decide, am I going to paint each stripe separately? Am I going to block in one color and try to draw just one side of the stripe? So I, in this case, I'm going to do the whole thing as though it's dark and then put the light stripes in after. So a good place to start with any dark at night is with sky color. So just mix up something that's close to sky. In this case, I'd say it's a little darker than sky, or a little uh, warmer than sky color. So I'm going to add some brown, maybe even grab some of this uh, cadmium mixture that I use for the wall. Mix that with some violet, which is alizarin and ultramarine. Maybe lighten it just slightly with that king's blue. Maybe a little red. I think that's probably a good color. So let's see how I did. So it's going down like a brown, which I think is fine. It's a little more violety maybe to me, so I'm going to just add a little bit of cobalt and magenta, king's blue. There we go. It's a little, a little more blue now. Put it down fairly thin because you're going to be painting over it. Never hurts to try to show form with the direction of your brush strokes also. So I'm making kind of a curvilinear stroke here. The underside of this canopy is pretty much all in light. I'm actually seeing the back side of the canopy because I'm underneath it. Uh, there are stripes in that also, but I can add those at the end. They're very faint. I think this edge right here is the most important in defining the form of this thing. So I'm going to make sure I get a nice arc to that. All right, let's go ahead and draw the Actually, I'm going to come back and put the lights over that because it just gives it a chance to dry a little bit. Let's go ahead and draw this building. To me, that is a uh, violet building with a little bit of glow from the neon on it. Kind of a violety brown brick. And it's, it's not in complete shadow, but there's definitely less illumination of it than other parts of the building. So I'm going to pick, take kind of a light violet, maybe mix it with just a little bit of that mixture I had for the wall and put that down and take a look. I think it actually can be just a little more on the yellow side. I'm going to 
pick a can yellow light. Put that down. That's pretty much what I saw at the time, I believe. Let's go ahead and finish it. And the closer I get to the, the neon side of the building, the pinker this all becomes. It definitely has to read, it definitely has to read lighter than the shadow side of that building. So when you think about it, that is a prismatic transition also. It's definite color change anyway. And I think the uh, value on this side is a little closer to what I have on that wall. So I'm just going to try to boost the pinkness of that a little bit. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Maybe keep a little pink even into this area. Okay. I think uh, this is the elephant in the room right now, that large wall. That wall is being illuminated by somewhat cool light. It's a yellow building. Uh, but the colors that I see in that, I think I see yellow. I see just a little bit of... Uh, red in it, and green. So I guess that's all the colors pretty much. Let's go ahead and start with the darkest part of that in the rear where there's less light. The light source is about here, I believe. So I'm going to take the kind of mud color that I've already got on my palette. I'm going to add some cad yellow light to it because this mixed with mud will be a little greener. I'm going to then add a little bit of ultramarine. There's already a little pink in the mixture. Maybe a tad of phthalo because there's a green light back in this courtyard. Let's see how that looks. So it's dark. I definitely want it to read as darker than this side. And if you're going to err, err on the side of darker. You can always lighten it later and it'll look more interesting to put light strokes over dark. What it looks uninteresting is when you have to darken something that's already too light. If you do that, you end up getting what looks like mud. So I'm going to start too dark. Might add just a little more warmth to that. Looks like there was some. When I say warmth, I'm dipping into my orange or red piles or yellow. I say cool, I dip it into the, into the greens and blues, or white. So at this point, I'm going to start pulling a little lighter color into that. Uh, and I'm going to add a little bit of yellow-orange. At the same time, I add some white because this is kind of a grayed out appearance of yellow typically during the day and it's still, to, to make it look a little more gray, I'm going to add some white. I'm going to try to blend that a little bit with the darker color behind. And now I'm going to add even more white and more yellow. It should read a little bit lighter in value than the neon illuminated wall. So let's see if I accomplish that. Before I go much further, I'm going to just check. But again, I could lighten it and it would still be something decent to look at. I just lighten it a little. OK, 
Okay. It's very important, I think, to get this little top piece. Okay, let's go ahead and put the sign in. I'm not going to put the words on the sign, but I am going to put the colors down. So let's start with the green. We start with a Thalo green, and it does have some yellow, ye yellowy warmth in it. I'm going to go to, to uh, orange and see what that does. To me, that looks a little warm on my palette. I'm going to cool it off a little bit. I'll put some ultramarine in it. See if I have it too light or too dark. Too dark is my choice. So at this point, I'll add a little more yellow to it. And maybe instead of ultramarine, I'll add a little bit of manganese. That's closer. It's got to be darker than the wall itself. And it looks like it comes up not quite halfway. Now it should get a little darker as I go to the right. So I'm going to just take a little bit of sky color and just add that over the top. There we go. So now I have a transition. Now let's do the red. I'm going to use the same brush, even though I'm going from green to red, because that's kind of a muted red and nothing mutes a color quite like the opposite color. So if I mix this red with just a little green that's on my brush, and I'm going to add a little bit of white and a little bit of yellow and see where it ends up. So I'm going to look at it on the palette first. It looks a little pink to me. I'll just add a little more red. I think that's still a bit pink. Value-wise, it still should be darker than the wall. I think that's a pretty good color. Now at some point I'm going to stand back and I'm going to look at all these colors and values next to each other and make sure that I haven't made any major value mistakes. Because even though drawing is really important, Value comes so close as a second level of importance that I like, lately have been really concentrating on that. All right, I'm going to just take a look right now. I think there's a little more brightness in that red towards the light side. I'll just take a little of this orangey white that I had mixed up earlier and put that in. Okay, that looks good. So I want to get this blocked in, so I'm going to keep working on uh, that objective. And so I think the next thing to get will be some of the color back into the shadow side of this. Now that's being hit by a green cast 
on kind of a violety building. So I'm just going to mix that green that I had in the sign with a little bit of violet. Actually, let me stop right now and just remix some violet. Again, that's five parts ultramarine and one part alizarin. I use my mixing device. So I'm going to add a little bit of violet to that green color. Yeah, so it's definitely in the green spectrum, and it looks like it's darker over here. And then it gets a little more yellow, and a yellow in the green realm usually means you use a cool yellow to mix with it, so I'll use Cad Yellow Light. And I'm specifically talking about nocturnes. Okay. And maybe even more of a transition from yellow to the more violety yellow by putting some of that cad yellow light specifically down here where I see it the most prominent. And that's probably just based on which direction the light source is coming from. It's probably coming from pretty low. Let's go ahead and get some of this in. Now that snow pile, snow Unlike a, like if that was a white building, it wouldn't look that white. Uh, but because it's snow, which is a crystalline structure, it actually reflects more light than you'd expect for something white. So I'm going to make it a little brighter than, than I would normally think about making it just because it's snow. Nonetheless, it's getting its light from multiple sources. And I'm going to start with probably the greatest source of light to that pile, and that's from the sky. So let's go with sky color. Let's start with a violet. I'm going to add a little more king's blue this time. And you can see that in areas like near the awning, it's catching a little more yellowy green light. And closer to us, it's catching some light from the uh, sign and from the wall above it. But on the sides, it's, there's a lot of that violet color, and then there's the mud color that I talked about earlier. So I think what I'm going to do is, as a block in color, I'm going to use the violet. Maybe leaning towards red. This will be the darkest part of the pile. I, as I put that down, I'm thinking that's a little too dark. I might actually add some white in this case. I could have added the king's blue as well. And now I kind of like that better. So I'm going to draw with this color. I'm going to try to get that pile in exactly as I see it. So right here kind of comes up to about this spot. There's a narrow, the pile narrows as it goes away from me due to perspective, of course. And then it gets a little wider out here. I've got a lot of lighter color to drag over that. Let me go ahead and make part of it a little lighter right now. There's some light hitting the side of the pile over here. A little bit up to here. And then on top of the pile, it's brighter. Eventually, it's going to get pinker as well. All right. And then some of that spills out onto the pavement. And there's a little ridge here.
Okay, so right now it doesn't look very congruous with the rest of the painting, but by the time I get the glare from other light sources, I think it'll fit into the painting just fine. Let's do that same color back here. There's a snow pile that has a little bit more green in it. Just a little, I'm gonna some reflection off of this. I'm just gonna put a little bit of phthalo in with it. I'm going to design this shape a little bit. Okay, similarly, there's a snow pile here on top of the wall. There's a bush here, but I'm gonna leave it out. We don't need more detail over there. I'm going to paint the um, ballet stand right there, and I'm seeing kind of a blue-green on the side of it because there's a green light back in that courtyard somewhere. It's a little bit lighter than that wall, and it's got a little bit of warmth in it. I might just add a little bit of orange. I'm happy with that. And then the front of it has a little more violet in it. And it looks to be roughly the same value. So the, the two sides are going to be different because of different color. I'm going to look at my uh, plein air piece to try to get a little closer to the right color. And in the plein air piece, the far side of that stand looks darker, so I'm going to make sure I get that. Okay, it's just roughly put in. There is a snow pile on top of that right here. And there's a snow pile, or there's some brightening of the snow pile back here with a little bit of illumination from over here. I'm going to go ahead and put these chairs in right now. Those chairs have a color pretty similar to this building. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and mix that color again, which had some yellow in it, a little bit of green, a little bit of red, and a little bit of white because it's more of a gray. I'm going to go ahead and put that in these chairs. I think they can be a little browner, a little redder. Eventually, I'm going to have a figure in those chairs. For now, I'm going to paint them as though there is no figure, but I can add that later easily. The brighter areas of illumination are yet to come. Right here, here, underside of the awning. And there's some light back here from the headlights of this car and then around this car. Oh, and then the lights of this building back here. I think I'm going to hit those next. Notice one thing about these lights compared to the building itself is that they're relatively bright, but they're definitely cooler than all my other lights in the, in the scene. There's probably fluorescent lights back there. And I also want to dim them down just a little bit just so they read as being in the distance. So I'm actually going to take a little bit of white, mix it with some mud color that I have on the panel or on the, on the palette. It is a light, so I better add some uh, warmer color as well. And I end up with kind of a muted yellowy orange. Let's see how that looks. So 
I think that's too, too dark. I'm going to add a little more white, a little more cad yellow light, which is a cooler yellow. So I think I'm getting close to a color I could put in there to work into. So let's do that. A little more yellow and white. And I'll be working back into those later. The lower side I make it a little bit irregular because there's some cars in a parking lot back there. All right, let's do, uh, let's do the illumination on this building. Like I told you, it's a yellow building. So let's go ahead and grab some yellow orange. Pretty sure at this point that I'm going to have to lighten up the, the yellow side of this building right here also, but I don't mind starting too dark. So I've been having fun with this big brush, but I think it's time to go smaller for some of this. White and yellow. and a little bit of orange. One thing I don't want to do is switch yellows. I don't want to go from a warm yellow to a cold yellow unless there's a reason. And right now I think I have a little bit of cad yellow light in my brush, so I'm going to clean this up and just make a new pile. Let's start with white, add cad yellow, not cad yellow light, and that's a warmer yellow. That's what I wanted. So this is relatively bright. I don't want to compete with the light sources. Remember, this is the illuminated part. So even though if I look at that separately, I can see that it's brighter here and gets duller here, that bright can't compete with that. So let me dull it down right now. I'll probably put a little bit of brown in it. Maybe just a little blue. And that would be the brightest spot on this wall. Okay. It's looking a little cool to me. I'm just going to warm it up with just a little bit of orange. Hit that one more time. Okay. The other side of the doorway, it's even a little dimmer. Brightest at the top. And then it should even dull further as I go down. I'm just going to add a little bit of violet to that. All right. And this wall where I have some orange color down originally from some, some of the light from up here. I'm going to use that same color, add just a little more violet, the same color I had in the lit portion, and I'm going to just go over this carefully and see if it can't still look like shadow, and it does. But it's now, it looks like it's in the same family. I'm going to do the same thing at the bottom here. And it's actually a prismatic shift. It goes from a yellow to a more orangey color. Some of that yellow I'm seeing over here now. This side of the building, there's a little piece of stucco that's a little too wide the way I've painted it. So I'm just going to enlarge my set of windows just to fill in that space a little better and narrow that section. So let's go ahead and paint these windows now. To me, that's brown and violet to mixture together. Not super dark, but dark. And I'm gonna, now I'm going to trim back on that wall. Okay. 
add a little more violet. One thing you don't want to do on an illuminated section is to make something too dark, which I believe I have done. So I'm going to actually lighten that up with a little bit of the cadmium mixture that I had. Because there's just so much light bouncing around near the front of this building. So I'm not going to make it quite as dark. We'll have to check later to see how I did. Let's paint the other windows set. This set, there's some dark and light areas in it. Let's paint the dark areas first and we can drag the light areas over. There's really like three pillars in there. So I'm going to make them all dark, but not black, just colorful dark. Two more pillars, one, two. That's enough for now. Make sure I get perspective on these benches or the seating. It's a little bit of a step sticking out here, like so. All right, let's get the underside of the awning. It's actually quite bright. If I look at my study, it's brighter than the pavement underneath, and that's how it looks in the picture as well. But there's more color in it than what it shows in the photograph. It'd be, it was a little more yellowy white. So let's go ahead and go to our muted pile. Just add a little more yellow and a little more white. And let's just go ahead and put the whole thing down as a stripe. This is the inside of the, the back side of the uh, awning. And in this case, the, uh, there are stripes on the back side of this, but they're just barely seen because of all the light hitting them. The values are really close together. So in this case, I chose to paint the light first, and I'm going to drag a little bit of, of dark over that to make those stripes on the far side of the awning. So there's that color, and then just a little bit down in value from that, and prismatically shifted to orange, I see the stripes of the rest of the awning along here. And I'll save that because I think what I need to do before I put that in is to paint the rest of the stripes. So let's paint the top of the canopy first. This gets reflected light from that sign. I'm going to mix a scarlet and I'm going to mix this uh, magenta, a little bit of white and yellow. We'll see if that's bright enough. So it should read just a little brighter than the building itself. So I'm going to add a little more uh, white yellow and orange to that. Let's try that. A little exaggerated, but I kind of like it. Okay. So there's the top of the canopy. I want to make sure it doesn't slope down. I think it's kind of borderline sloping down right now. Let me raise it up just a little bit. Okay. And out of that, I'm going to go ahead and drag the, the light part of the awning. I don't want this too light. So I might actually 
you can actually mix black with some of these colors. So I'm going to start with a gray with black and white and just blend it into a rough color that I see, which is kind of a yellowy orange. And I'm going to go ahead and just start putting these down. I'm going to start in the front. Okay, I think that's not bad. I'm going to just make that a little wider. I'm going to just add a little more red to that. And now I'd say all these stripes are pretty equal in thickness, so that's what I'm going to shoot for. Kind of like the uh, painting the sign, I'm going to be a little slower for this section because I want to get it right. Helps to find a brush that's roughly the right thickness. I'm not putting in as many stripes as are there, and that's just a judgment call. You could if you wanted. I don't want this to look overly rendered, even though I would certainly be accused of that sometimes. But for now, I'm just going to limit those stripes to some few wider ones. As I go back in the distance, that arc should get a little bit stronger. And then towards the back, you can see there's some color coming through. There must be a, a red light back behind the awning at some point. And I'm going to make sure I get that because I think that's a nice addition. And that's something that I can paint over paint, that little glow. So I'll do that. Question is, do I want one more light stripe or not? I'm not sure that I really do. I guess I'll put one more in. A little skinny one. Okay. Uh, I'm going to reinforce the kind of the violety color I had on the front of that awning because I want to get the right shape there. So that looks good. Now, uh, the yellow on the back side of that awning should stop at the doorway, and I extended it over the doorway, so I'm going to fix that right now. Just a little darker color up here again. Okay, and then similarly, that the light on the light side should extend up to the awning. I'll show you. Remember that was white, muted a little bit, and a little bit of yellow. Okay. There, starting to look right. Let's go ahead and get some uh, light on the pavement on the ground plane. That's down in value from the light against the wall. These are much closer to the light sources. This is further away and it's catching light from the yellow light back here, but also a little red light from anywhere from this area. There's even a red light back here, which why don't I put that in just to remind me. Uh, so I'm going to go with a, pretty much the same color I'm seeing on the wall behind the neon. It's got pink in it, and it looks like it's right here.
Okay. And I can make that a little stronger later if I want to. All right, let's go ahead and do the color on the pavement. I'm going to start with a whitish, yellowish orange, mostly yellow orange. And let's put that down in front of the steps right there. The step, for some reason, doesn't look as bright, but in my plein air study, I painted it almost the same brightness as the pavement next to the step. So I'm going to go ahead and do the same. I'm going to have to say that that's going to be more accurate. So I'm putting orange there. I do want to see a prismatic shift. It's going to go from orange and as it gets darker, it should travel through scarlet and then kind of an alizarin. All of that is a little bit muted by the fact that this is on kind of a dark, not super dark, but a, a pavement that isn't white. So I'm going to try to darken all of that a little bit with some mud. You can actually use a complement. Let's, meet, let's use the, the phthalo and just mix it with those colors. And now you'll see that's kind of a muted warm color. Uh, it shows up again a little more red on the other side of the flower pot. And then there's also a little more red in a transition from that lit area to the shadow next to it. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in. On the other side, it's interesting, it goes a prismatic shift the other way from red to yellow to green because there's some green light over here. I'm going to put the yellow in the way I see it. And then I'm going to transition that through some phthalo green and yellow mix. and then into some brown as it gets a little darker. Okay. So you can kind of see how I'm working out this transition from the lit pavement to the shadow side of the pavement. Okay. There's a, a bush, like I told you, on the side of the building that I'd put in in a, just a general violety tone when I blocked it in. I'm going to make that a, more of the color that it should be, which is kind of a phthalo -y green. And at the top of that, based on my study, I could see just a little bit of a rim light over the top of it. So that rim light, I'm going to make it just a little bit towards the yellow. Okay, there's a similar thing going on on these trees. I have a yellowy green as it faces the doorway. We're getting there. I'm going to reinforce some of the darks on the canopy now. Up here, it looks like they blend a little more and I want to just put that little gradation in between the bright stripe at the top and the black stripes, something like that. Uh, there's also a band of dark where the armature underneath the awning sits and it leaves a little ver uh, horizontal line right there. I kind of liked how that looked, so I'm going to put that in. This is a very soft little brush. I just got these. Um, but it's a synthetic. Any little synthetic soft brushes are really helpful for this kind of thing. 
Okay. Now let's put in the stripes on the far side of that canopy. They're a little more, they're a little warmer than this front side of the canopy. So I'm going to just go right into some red, mix it with a little bit of my violet, and go ahead and put those down a little, uh, somewhat randomly. I don't want them to line up with the stripe on the other side. I'm going to actually kind of move it a little bit to the brown side. I think that's all right. I tell you, it's hard to paint dark paint over light paint, so don't do it very often. There we go. As I look at this now, I want to, well, let, me, let me finish blocking it in. So right here, you can see the side mirror of this car comes out about right here. And just below that, there's a line that represents the base of a snow pile. And that snow pile is be, being hit by illumination from the headlights of this car. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in. It's relatively bright. You can imagine headlights hitting a snow pile. But it's a pretty cool bright. So I'm just going to do a kind of a muted white. I want it down a little bit from this. I don't want it to compete. And let's put that down. Definitely on the cool side. And then I'm going to blend that into the darker side of that snow pile, which is catching light from the sign primarily, and then that baseline violet from the sky. So I'm going to mix a violet. And then we're going to add a little pink to it, just a little red. Add some white, and let's put that over here. Okay. I'm going to use a little of that violet to just transition from a more white to a violety white. All right. Now, I don't want this pile to be too big. I guess I have to trim it off a little bit. Beyond the pile, there's sidewalk, and there's another pile on the other side, <clears throat> which seems to be getting more yellow light. It'll be quite muted, but I'm going to go ahead and mix kind of a violety yellow mixture and put it right here. And I'll have to work on that uh, a little bit later. For now, I have a baseline color down. I think one thing I could do is bring the fence line down just a little bit. All right, almost covered. I'm not going to quit till it's covered. All right, there's a, a little bit of the neon is catching the pavement just in front of that pile of snow right here. Uh, 
I haven't done this enough. I'm going to do this now just to make a point, and that's stand back often from your painting. And as I do that, to me, it looks like my awning is too level. It should be tilted up a little bit to my left uh, and match the perspective of the building. So I'm going to do that now. This is always, it's always hard to get yourself to do this, but <clears throat> you should uh, very easily be able to change something. So I'm going to carry that awning down a little further on this side and try to get that angle correct. Remember, I already lifted up the bright side up here. I think I needed to do that to this lower side. So let's go ahead and fill that in. Shouldn't take much time. That's better. So if you have trouble with one area, put something down, but then Try to live with it for a while and come back once it's dried. It's so easy to just, or not easy, it's, it's hard to resist trying to fix something right away when you know it's wrong. Uh, so I've partially fixed it. I'll come back later and I can fix that much better. In the meantime, let's go ahead and keep working on these uh, surfaces that I haven't covered yet. So the top of the snow pile over here needs a uh, reflection from the neon. I'm going to take a second also to clean my palette. It's kind of nice to leave the palette unclean to some degree for a while because you can keep finding colors that you've used and like to, would like to reuse. But at some point when things start looking a little muddy, go ahead and clean it all off and start over. But right now, as I said, I want to go ahead and put some uh, reflections on the snow piles. Let's start with what's reflecting from the neon, which of course would be a pinkish color. Again, I dip into some of the cadmiums, but also into that magenta. You may not see many scenes that require magenta, so don't rush out and buy it necessarily. But this particular one definitely had that color in it. Now, as I just mix that, I'm starting to see a lot of that color also up here. I'm going to just go ahead and put that up here right now. It'll help that look like it fits better also when I start putting it on the snow. I'm also going to use that same color in the awning right here. Okay, and now let's put it on the snow. So this is, uh, again, kind of a design thing you have to do. Try to figure out exactly how you want to design this snow pile. You can use the photograph or nature as much as you can, but at some point you have to ad lib things once in a while to create a simpler design, something easier to paint and simpler. And really, the eye appreciates uh, simplicity sometimes. All right. I'm going to add a little more uh, cadmium reds to this. You can see that there's just a little sliver of light sneaking behind that stand.
Okay. Add a little more white and cadmium scarlet to this. Try to beef that up just a little bit. And let's get the snow pile on top of the uh, stand. It'll be pink on top of kind of a violety color where the sky is hitting the snow. It's interesting, when I look at my uh, plein air piece, this red is not quite as prominent as what I see on the photograph. I, instead, I see a little more uh, light blue on some of these planes, and I have to trust what I saw from life. So the other thing I saw was a little bit of red over on this side of these snow piles which would make sense. So here's some of that blue. I'm going to use a little king's blue with manganese. And I'm going to put that on some of these top surfaces. And then I'm going to use a little more violet -y color for these snow piles where there's not quite as much uh, reflected light from other areas. There was, there's a lot of reflected light on this snow pile on the ground because there's buildings on this side of the street. There's cars coming at it, uh, tail lights shining into it. So those will be more of a mixture of colors. I'm going to keep working on this sidewalk. There's quite a nice color transition there from now from this green area back to uh, a darker red. And the red is, is again from this sign. But there's a, the green area is actually a shadow from this awning from here to about here. And so some of that green color is from inside the awning, this yellow light hitting the inside of the awning. And the red color on either side then is from this light and this wall. So let's go ahead and start with the, the darker green and add a little brown to that. It should be lighter than the upright planes in that area. I'm just going to add a little bit of white to it. But it's still going to read as dark pavement. And then as I approach this end, I'm going to start transitioning from green to brown to alizarin. I'm going to have to lighten that up just a little bit. As I look at my reference, I see this color green in here. And then I'm going to add some brown. Now I want to transition into that red, as I said. Put some alizarin in that. And now 
the lizard. The wall behind this, the valet stand is getting red from the neon as well. Just a hint. So again, I'm going to use the alizarin. It has a nice straight top edge and the bottom edge is scalloped due to the snow up against it just a little bit. And as I take that off the end, I'm just going to Transition it either to violet or green, but let's say violet. Just so it reads, everything is a transition and usually prismatic. Okay, uh, let's get a little more shape to this snow pile. I'm going to cut back into it first with the yellowy orange down here. Okay, and I'm probably okay with that green section, although now I see that green needs a little more yellow in it. I don't want to have similar shapes all in a row, so I'm going to cut this one hump into two. Have a straight area, have a curved area. Quite an indent right there. And now there's some nice, pretty bright red light that starts about right here that I see mainly on this side of the sidewalk because this side is catching more light from that sign. Transition it a little bit into a lizard out here. Right now I want to work on the road behind this car. It's good to have a little more opacity in that uh, darkness first, so I'm going to do that. So I'm going to definitely have a lot of alizarin in it and a little bit of violet. And I should transition from darker to lighter as I approach that car. Bigger brush is always a good idea. Let's try this one. So I'm laying down the darks over which I will lay down the reflection of those taillights. I don't want to get too far off from sky color in some of this, so I'm going to start adding a little bit of blue back into it. Okay. And that'll brighten up quite a bit as soon as I add the light over the top of it. In the meantime, there's a really nice shadow here that I want to get off this wheel well, or off this tire rather. It's a nice violety color. Okay. And then I already have the dark over here. I'm going to reinforce that a little bit. Now, even though the photograph shows a lot of light over here, I'm going to not have much light because I don't want my eye to be dragged off the edge. I'm going to just make this just a kind of a very slight value difference from the shadow of the tire. 
and make it a violet. So you see how that automatically now brings my eye back into play into the middle of the painting. Right here, there is a valet stand as well, but this one, a person sits in it. And I'm gonna quick draw it out. And the reason I put it in is it catches this uh, nice green light from the, a light source in the back parking lot. And I wanna make sure I get this in. So I'm gonna draw it out first. There's a little driveway that comes out right here that'll also have some illumination on it that runs into this driveway. Uh, and that is all kind of a green color. So I'm gonna start with some phthalo, add a little bit of yellow, put that down as my start, it's wrong. So I'm gonna add a little bit of uh, the king's blue and a little bit of white until that looks like pavement to me. I think it can still use a little more yellow Cad yellow light, a little more white. And as I transition it out here, it'll mix with the orange that I already have in place. Somewhere between the orange and the green, I want some yellow because that would make it more prismatic as far as a shift goes. Still going to be a dulled yellow compared to nearer the, the light itself. Okay, something like that. I think I can even have more white in the more white and yellow in the lit area right here. The let's put the uh, little valet shed in as well. So here's a little bit of green. A little lighter on the light side, I just added some yellow. Okay. The darker side, I'll just mix a little bit of phthalo with violet or blue. Now that'll read it's darker. And there's two sides to this. Okay. And now you don't really see the walls of, or the uh, par partitions of this. So I just put in a color just to make it a dark. Maybe even add a little bit of violet or uh, magenta just to show that it's catching some, some light from the building itself. Okay. I need to work on this, this stand just a little bit. I'm just gonna redraw it. I think that looks better. So at this point, uh, once everything is blocked in, you, you don't have as much to do as you think, but it's all the fun stuff later. You get to put in all these nice transitions of color and so forth. I'm going to do one last thing and then I'm going to take a break. And that's to uh, reinstate this lit side of the canopy, the back side. Again, I'm going mainly off of my plein air study.
So I just made kind of a pinky gray to finish off this awning. So at this point, I'm going to ask myself what, what is bothering me the most. And what bothers me the most, besides not finishing that tree yet, is the color of the snow. I'm going to work on that. I'm going to refine a little bit the shape of this car. I've got it a little too squat now, so I'm going to make it a little bit higher. And I'm going to do that by increasing the bottom of the, or bringing the bottom of the car down, including the shadow. Uh, because I think the car is a little big for the building, so if I bring the front down, it's, it's essentially uh, making the car come forward a little bit, which would make sense then for its size. So here I'm just going to add some right now to the bottom. And I think you'll see that this will help make it look like the right size. Okay, and now let's go ahead and put in the reflections. So if these are close to uh, scarlet, red or scarlet, then I'm going to start the reflection prismatically down from that. I'll start at kind of a reddish alizarin. So let's just go ahead and mix those two and put them in position. Okay, you can see what a difference that already makes. By the way, reflections on wet pavement or snow-covered pavement are always vertical. They don't, they don't angle towards your eye, so make them vertical. So, already that looks like correct uh, reflection, but I'm going to make them even a little bit more dramatic by lightening just a little bit on the inside of those dark bands. And I'm just going to add a little bit of scarlet to those colors and just lay down a second row in the middle. Okay. Like that. So, um, I'm going to work on this stand just a little bit. I think it catches a little bit of pink down in the lower part. Like so. I think it's uh, at some point I've got to tackle that snow pile again. And again, I'm stuck a little bit between two images my uh, plein air piece and the photo. The photo was shot at a little bit different time than the plein air piece, so it's hard to say. I'm just going to kind of split the difference, although I kind of am doing that. There's a shadow back by the canopy trees right here that I think I need to define better right here. And that separates the shadow part of the sidewalk from this illuminated part. I'm just going to make that more of a gradation like so. And then back here I'm seeing some of the sidewalk as a darker color. So I think I'm going to take that same color which I just did it's kind of a warm gray and put some hint of a darker sidewalk back there. There's a figure in the, the uh, ballet shed. I'm going to go ahead and put that in right now. And I think with just a little highlight, that'll read, read as a figure. I'm going to put some uh, darks underneath the, at the base of the valet stand. They're a little warm, 
And I think that'll help define this stand a little better. Similarly, there's a little shadow at the top underneath a, the lip of this thing. And it transitions into the rest of the stand. So at this point, I have pretty much everything covered, which I'm happy about, uh, but I still have lots to work on in the illuminated areas with more drawing and a few additional color changes. We're not to the final steps yet. I haven't blocked in the darks on the tree yet, so I'll be doing that shortly. Let's work on the snow pile just a little bit longer. I'm gonna mix a third color for the snow pile and it's going to be manganese blue and white. I don't want to do too many because it'll get too busy. But I definitely want some. And I want to vary the width a little bit. <laughs> I don't like that. I'm going to scrape that out. We're going to do that again in a little bit. So there's, like I, uh, I've shown you, there's some street lights back here that will obviously be casting some yellowy orange light onto the snow pile back there. And I think we'll get that right now. And that also projects the same color back on this snow pile. Okay. Let's go ahead and put some reflected light on the top of the cars. So what's reflecting onto the cars? It's the street light, the stop lights, and that uh, yellowy uh, shorter light right here. So let's start with a yellow and thin line along the top of the car and also on the corner where the top meets the side, right there. Okay. Let's go ahead and try that with the green, phthalo green, because this will be now some rim lighting reflecting off the metallic car from these green uh, stoplights. And then the rest, I still want the top to read as brighter than the rest of the car. So I'm just taking kind of a neutral gray and I'll connect these. All right. So that's one car. There's still plenty to do on that car. Uh, one thing that you'll notice from the photograph is there's some reflected light from across the street hitting this side of the window right here. And then there's a cool light hitting the side of the car down here. So let's pick up a cool color. And put it down in that shape. Okay. I'm going to trim that down just a little bit and bring it a little closer to the side. So to trim it down, I'm just going to take another color that we see on the street and it'll be a red from some stray uh, tail light. And let's go ahead and trim it. Right. 
you want to reinforce the shadow next to the car, right here. Because it's a cast shadow, it's not going to be as dark as an upright shadow on the car itself. There's some ambient light being uh, hitting that area, so let's put that in. And now I'm going to reinforce the shadow behind this car. Like that. Throw a little more darkness into this side of the street. So that area I think is looking good. This building looks to me to be warmer than what I have and it's a little lighter than the sky. So I'm going to go ahead and fix that right now. We'll just take this red pile, add a little bit of yellow to it. And I think if I put that over what I have, I'm going to be close. Maybe a little too gray because there's some white in that mixture. Let's start over. Let's take a little bit of alizarin, add a little bit of cad yellow light. And now I have a much richer dark orange. I'm going to add a little more alizarin and maybe a little violet and brown. There we go. So that's the color I'm going for. I'm going to outline this canopy again. So now I can actually see that building behind and it looks a little more correct. Now I'm about to do the around the windows of that building. And there's actually, believe it or not, even from a window, you'll see a little bit of a halo. So I'm gonna go with more of an orange right next to these windows. And in between them. And that'll help even the windows to look like they have a glow. I see that same color in the distance down here. That area is just slowly getting a little better, but I don't think it's quite where I want it yet. I think that there's got to be some shape to the end of this snow pile right here where everything flattens out. And so I'm going to bring this, this light in this uh, window, I'm going to bring it down a little bit. because these are cars up above on a parking lot. I think that'll help actually. On the far side of that building, going away from us, there's a few additional windows that look pinkish to me. Something like that. All right, let's get some color into the tree. I like that it's primarily a silhouette. So I'm going to keep it fairly dark, but dark with a little color. Let's start with violet. Let's add brown. Brown will make it look like 
green in at dusk. So why at dusk would I paint it that way? But there's enough ambient light around that it's almost like it's at dusk so that I see enough color in things up close like this. And I want to get that tree to be not quite as dark as this wall. So let me paint the wall a little darker. All right. Now I'm going to go with green and red, and of course by green I mean phthalo green, and now see how we do. So that's a color that I like right there. I might go a little darker at the base and then lighter at the top. And now I can start working on the form of this tree a little more. Branches go upward at the bottom. Actually all branches go upward on this tree, which is kind of the usual with trees. Um, I'm going to add a little more red now, especially on this side, because it's going to catch some red from the neon, neon light. And then on the other side, I'm going to skew it towards green, because there's cool light on that other side. Okay, you see the difference? So treat it like a solid mass and then later you can add some sky holes, although in this case they'd be up against a, a building, but there'll be holes nonetheless and uh, it'll give that a little bit of air that it feels like I feel like it needs. And there's the wall behind here. It's got a little bit of green in it from the ambient light that's hitting it. Let's put a few holes in right now with that green color. Don't want to overdo it. Okay. And then up at the top, there's some yellow coming through from that building behind, kind of a warmish, greenish yellow. Okay. Well, we got it blocked in. You can always add the figures at the end. I will be doing that. Let me just uh, fix this stand a little more. A little broken color on that stand. So I'm going to look for areas where I can improve some transitions. I still think I can have this a little softer where it meets the shadow. There is that kind of a yellowy green cast to some of the snow over on this end of the snow pile. I'm going to do that now. Okay, that helps. I'm going to keep working on this sidewalk over here. Try to connect it up with that driveway. I'm 
Yep. I think I'm going to just extend one of the reflections on the top of that car and try to make this look flatter. There we go. A little improved color next on this violet or the uh, kind of violety brick building, which is catching warm light here and cool light here. Uh, I'm going to go back into that and I'm going to use a little bit of the magenta and violet and just a little bit of uh, red and white and see if I can't get a better light color for this area. A little more white, a little more red and magenta. I think it needs to be a little more orangey, so I'll add some scarlet. Let's try that. Yeah, that to me, that's looking better. This looks like the color I see under here. And then as I move further away, I seem to be getting darker and a little bit more towards the alizarin. Something like so. A little too dark. We go back to this color. I might actually go to a little violet now. Keep it light, but add violet and white together. There we go. Got a couple lines that don't really match up uh, as far as how vertical they are or aren't. This looks like it angles this way relative to the building. I'm going to try to get some of that angle back. I'm going to assume this was correct. Let me take one more look at that. Yep. Okay. And again, I, because there's a lot of ambient light, I don't want those darks to read quite as dark. So I'm just going to add a little red back into this. There's some darks in that tree that if I think I, if I can finish those, I might be just done with the tree, which would be nice. So I'm going to mix up a dark mixture, fairly warm with some brown. And wherever I see a real dark dark, I'm just going to add it. Essentially, these are underplanes. It just gives it a little more form. We'll leave it like that. There's some uh, bushes in here that are also very dark and I'm going to put those in. There's an underplane here that I've done once before. I'm just going to reinstate that. It's a little darker underneath that. Same with the front of it. 
there's a gray cap on that building. I'm going to go ahead and put that in. It's kind of a greenish brown. And just a little darker than the side of the wall. Maybe a little yellow in it even. That looks right. And now it's these little things that tend to make a difference. So just when you think you're done, look for these things. So we're going to take a break real soon. Before I do, I want to just reinstate the darks on that canopy. To me, that's the weak link so far. That's again a violet. And I just think they should all be darker. Put a little warmth back into it with this brown. Soft brush. That'll give it a little more snap again. So I'm correcting this plein air style in that I have to use a soft brush and a little more paint than usual in order to cover up this lighter color. If, if you're doing this in the studio, you just simply wait until the next day and you can paint right over it. Okay, uh, we're back for another session and what I've done since uh, completing this uh, portion yesterday is that I've taken a long look at the painting and uh, typical of this, 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 uh, at this point in the painting, I usually take a long look and I actually make a list of things that I would like to improve in the painting. So I have that list next to me and I'll be going through this one at a time as I show you what the correction is or the improvement is that I'm making. So we'll go ahead and get started. So the first thing I want to correct or, or improve are a few of the drawing uh, errors that I believe are present. And one thing I want to do to start with is to increase the angle of this building. I don't want it to look like I have bad perspective on a square building. So I want to make it very different from the perspective on this squared up sign. So I'm just going to increase that angle a little bit. As I do that, the entire uh, side of this building should be a little cooler than what I have made it. If it were cooler, first of all, that's closer to what it looked like, but also it'll uh, set off the color on the other side of the building. So I'm going to make this whole side a little bit cooler as I redraw the uh, angle. I'm actually going to use a little black mixed with some yellow and white. and see how close I come. Might keep a little warmth in it, but not much. And I want to keep it roughly that same value, which I believe I have done. So at this point now, I'm going to at least make the angle correction. Okay.
Now, this is the second coat over paint. I don't have to cover it completely. I can kind of uh, just put dabs of paint down and I might get a nice broken color effect. So I'm going to start that way and if it doesn't look right, then I'll just fill the rest of it in with this color. But for now, I'm going to leave a little of that warmth underneath. Yeah, I think that's looking better. The other thing that I noticed when I stood back and took a closer look is that the value does change a little more dramatically on this side of the building than what I had shown. And this was the brightest portion of the building. So from here, I'm going to darken it as I move back and try to approach the color I do have back there, which I think is correct. So I'm going to, at this point, try to find a transition from this color to this color. So I'm going to start with sky color, which is violet and a little bit of brown. I'll just mix that into my other pile. And just to prismatically shift it a little bit, I'll go to cad yellow. Also a little more yellow light. And see if I get any darker. I did. So you can see a transition there already. And I think that's helping the picture. Definitely a cooler color. As I keep moving back, I'm going to make sure I continue to darken this color and shift it just slightly prismatically. So I'm adding a little more orange and brown back to a little more cad yellow light. Now at this point, I do want at least that value. So I want to start with something closer to that value. I'll add a little more violet. That's closer. And now I'm going to pull some of that back forward over what I put down here. And the same down here. So my goal here is to just get a convincing transition that looks like the same color going back in space. And yet preserve some of the darkness, uh, some of the value uh, darkness that I had back here. So that accomplishes that portion. Uh, the next thing that was bothering me was the angle of this wall. I believe it's a little too horizontal. It's below the, my angle of sight. And so there should be a little more of an, an up angle towards the uh, vanishing point. So what I'm going to do is just take that snow pile and pull it down just a little bit here. And it's subtle, but Everything in painting is relatively subtle. <laughs> so that, that helps that. And now at the bottom of that wall, which is a warm, dark, I'm just going to make that a little bit lower here as well. Okay. I believe that now reads as though it's aimed towards the uh, vanishing point a little better. All right, another thing to correct. The sidewalk does slope down towards the road, but I believe I have the, uh, this angle too severe. So I'm going to try to flatten this out by having this light area look a little more horizontal. Similarly, the shadow behind it a little more horizontal. So I'll start with the, the shadow 
And again, there should be sky color in it, so I'm going to start with a little violety brown. And it's not super dark, but it's dark, so I just added just a little bit of the uh, King's Blue. Uh, I've just raised the shadow up a little bit on this side, so and I'm going to do the same with the light area. Remember that was yellow light on pavement with a prismatic shift towards the street. So I'm going to go with orange right here. And that raises that up just a little bit. At the same time that I do that, I'm going to just raise the snow pile up a little bit near that. Uh, it's down low because I had it angled too severely downward, the sidewalk. So now that I've flattened it out, I can raise that snow pile up just a little bit. So I'm going to go with a violet, relatively dark even. And we'll go like so. Another thing to fix. Uh, well, before I do that, I'm just going to put a little shadow behind these little bushes. Okay, and back with snow. The next thing that I wanted to fix was because this sidewalk recedes into the distance, I want the widest part of the sidewalk to be in the foreground. So I'm just going to widen that a little bit by cutting back into the snow that I had there. And as you recall, that was had some uh, red tones to it back here. And at the same time, the uh, valet stand, I believe, got too far out into the sidewalk, so I'm cutting back into that right now. Okay. There, I like that better. So there are some cars out in front of that main car right here that are parked. And all you see are the tops of those cars, but I want to get some of those in. They also are bathed in red light from the uh, glare from the, the brake lights of these cars. So I'm going to mix kind of a violety brown and add a little bit of alizarin. And I'll just put a few of those in. These will also receive a little top uh, lighting, some glare. That'll help make these read as cars. The last car, I'm going to make it just a little lighter, but still a dark. OK. It's a good time now to reinstitute some color into this car. I'm going to use that same red. The valet shed, the small valet shed, has a, a dark side and a light side to it. And I made them both roughly the same value. I'm going to just darken the side facing the street a little bit. And I'm going to start with a little bit of green, add some violet, and simply place a dark side. Similarly, the top of this shed should be a little darker. Okay. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to now darken the fence along that parking lot, which intersects the valet shed right here. And then it recedes. Up against that fence is some snow, and that's a lighter color, obviously. And it's catching reflected light from lots of different sources, so I'm going to make it kind of a pinkish yellow and pile it a little bit irregularly up against that fence. And then I think I can leave this alone. 
And I'm going to keep working on leveling out that sidewalk. There's an area right here that I think I can improve on. It's catching some yellow light and some green light. And it'll end up looking something like this. I'm going to reinstate this little dark line underneath this snow pile right here. Make it a little more level as well. I think that's getting a little too dark for this area. I'm just going to cut back with some uh, lighter paint. So this has been bothering me since I put it down, but the canopy to me is reading too light. And I've already darkened the dark stripes, so it, to me that's saying that I probably have the light stripes too bright. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to not have those stripes quite as well defined. I'm not sure that that's that important for this picture. So I'm going to use a bigger brush, and I'm just going to take some dark paint, and I'm going to kind of loosely paint over that and see if I can maintain a dark appearance but still striped. So I'm going to take some violet, a little brown, and let's see if I can do that. Get a little more pigment. Okay. Kind of like what that is doing. And if necessary, I can add some light back over that, but I wanted to start with a darker color again. Let me try to put in even more paint down. And then, then adding some just subtle stripes. If this doesn't work, I'll scrape this down. And I kind of see that it probably isn't. Let me get a little bit of a different color on the top just to create some form. It should be a little redder because it catches just a little bit of reflected light off the, the building. So I'm going to add a little red to that mixture. Okay, and now I think I will put some stripes back in, but I'm not going to put as many and I'm not going to make them as wide. And I've got to decide on a color. It's very gray. Let me just take the color that I did have and add a little bit of the King's Blue to it. And see what I get. That's pretty subtle. Let me add just a little bit of yellow orange to that.
think that's better. I'm going to get some of that brighter red that is coming through. It actually looks almost pink. So I'll add a little of the uh, magenta again and reinforce these red spots coming through the stripes. Okay. And now I want to repaint that thin line of reflected light on the top of that awning. It's a little brighter. Put a little cad yellow light into it. A little more. Okay, um, some more corrections or improvements. I believe this got a little bit too light over here. There's not a lot of light hitting that side of the building, so I'm just going to darken it slightly with sky color. And it's, it, it is kind of a violet, violety brick, so I'm going to just add a little bit of orange and violet together. And I'll put that down. I don't want to completely match the value of the back wall, but I do want to make it darker than what it was. And I think that will help with the illusion of a glow from that light source onto that building. And then a prismatic transition and a value transition. Okay, I think that's better. So when I look at my um, uh, previous study and my photographs, I feel as though this sign is not reading bright enough compared to the wall that it is illuminating. And so I've got to get a little more, uh, a little darker value into this wall and yet maintain that color which is emitted, of course, from the sign. So to start with, I'm going to just start at the top and I'm going to add sky color with prismatically shifted orangey pink, which would now then be what, alizarin and, and red. So let's see how that works. Sky color, red and alizarin. Let's put that down and it's going to be just barely darker, that, or barely lighter than sky if it reads the way I want it to read. because you actually almost lose that top edge. So I think that's pretty close to what I want. And now I'm going to ignore the trim for now. And I'm just going to make a transition down towards the, the lower part of that wall. So now I'm going to add a little bit of scarlet and a little red. And let's try that next. Mm -hmm. And now we'll go to orange. Mix it into the same pile. And remember, there's a little pinkness to this. I'm, I'm going to dip again into the uh, Magenta. I always struggle for the name of that because I don't usually use it. Okay. 
and then even a little more orange as I get over to this side. Okay, so I've darkened that considerably. Uh, I think it's a good place to start now. I might still add a little more color at the end uh, back into that. Uh, there is, for instance, a little orangey red up above this little section. And I'll put some of that in now. I wanted to reinforce the red glow on the sidewalk back here. I think it's kind of an important area of illumination. I think it really adds to the vibrancy of this painting. So I'll go ahead and add this. And it t tends to fade off then towards this side of the sidewalk. If I overdo it, I'll just go back with my sky color, paint over it just a little bit. The tree I thought that it was more, uh, it was better when I had this edge of the tree lost into the shadow of this building. So I'm going to darken the back side of this building next to the tree until I can actually lose some of the edges of that tree. Again, I'll start with st sky color mixed with brown, but I will add a little bit of phthalo again because there's a green light over in this section of the painting. So let's start with that and see how it looks. And there I can pretty much lose that edge. So that's what I had hoped to do. I'm going to take that same color. I'm just going to go into the tree a little bit with it and darken the overall value of that tree, especially near the bottom. In general, trees will be a little darker at the bottom. Okay, I think that's pretty well set up now for the figure that I'll be adding at the end. Just gonna lower the snow pile here a little bit with a dark color, which is the bushes in the background. It's starting to look a little too lumpy. I'm just going to smooth it out. Okay. And then there's probably a shadow on the wall from the tree as well. So I really want to get the darkest part of the wall just next to that left side of that tree. And underneath. So the neon sign, I think I can improve it even a little more just by adding Remember I said neon is the, is the bulb. It sits against a band of illumination, which is one or two steps down in value and color. And then you drop again dramatically down to the sign itself. And I think I can show that second drop between the illuminated band and the sign a little better if I reinforce some of the dark uh, at the edges of the sign. And this will be very subtle, but I think most people will perceive a difference. So I already have changed quite a bit of it, I think. I'm trying not to stand too close to this to block your view, but when I get down to these small brushes, I don't have a lot of choice. There we go. So that's what I had in mind. All right, uh, another thing I need to change is the sign. I already did have a transition from light to dark, but I think I can reinforce that a little more. So let's start with the green. I'm going to go to Thalo, mix with sky, and a little bit of something warm. Let's put orange in it. 
and see if I can get this darker. Yep. Now I told you early on that I try to make things a little too dark at the beginning. Uh, and that is a better way to go. But I didn't do that in this case, so I'm left to try to make corrections. So that's, that's where I'm at. I'm going to darken the red now a little bit. Now red is a pretty dark pigment right out of the tube, but I don't want brilliant red there. I want to tone it down a little bit so I can let it mix in a little bit with some of the mud on my palette. There. That's reading as though it's getting darker. I'm going to just make it even a little more. I'll put a little bit of uh, alizarin in it. Okay. Let's finish this sign. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put, there's a border around it. And if I was doing a quick sketch outside, I might leave that off, but I've got time to do it and I think it looks good. So I'm going to try to mix the color for that border, which is just slightly bluer than the rest of the sign. So I'm going to add a little manganese to that. Put a little bit of a warmth to it. And I would say it's roughly the same value as the green. So let's see how I do. It's a little dark. Let's lighten it just slightly. King's blue. That's a color I like. Yep. That got a little bit uh, dark. I'm just going to put a little more King's Blue in that and take one more stroke on it. That's a little better. This top part even looks a little lighter to me than the bottom, so I'm just going to put a little yellow into this mixture. And I want to make sure that I don't match the angle of this top of the building. It's going to have to instead follow perspective. So it's going to be closer to this angle. So I might flatten out a little bit of what I have there. Okay, I'm just going to patch in the red actually I'd hardly have to do it there's a little white border on the inside of that so uh, let me patch between the red and the green let's put a little green back in Okay, so now it's time for the lettering, and I think because this takes a while, I'm going to start the lettering, and we'll take a break and catch back up once I get the lettering completed. I'm going to show you how I get it started, however. I do it again with the back of my brush, and I scratch it in first. I'm paying most attention to the top and bottom of these letters, where they end up. There's not a lot to see right here, because I can barely see it, but it's there. 
And the other thing to think about is you're trying to do this in perspective. So I want these letters to, of course, descend towards the uh, vanishing point as well. I think that's going to work. So at this point then I'm going to go ahead and fill this in. And the, I think the color that I'll start with, it's white lettering on a yellow building. But I think if I start with the color of the building and add just a little white to it, I think the value will be pretty close to what it should be. So I'm going to go back to the building color, which was yellow and black, mixed with a little bit of white, just a little orange. Add some more white now, and it's just, I'd say it stays pretty cool, so I'm not going to be adding much color to this other than what I had as a base color. And let's just see how this looks. I can already tell that's not quite right, and I do have to add just a little bit of red to it. I want it just to be slightly pink. I'm going to look at that and make sure that it's the color and value I want. I think it's a little bit off still. I can go a little brighter. Let's put a little yellow in it this time. A little yellow, a little white. But it's a warmer color than, the, than this, I believe. That's pretty close. Okay, so I'm going to take a smaller brush and I'm going to show you the first couple letters and then we'll cut back after I get the rest of it in. Uh, you can see now I've got the sign completed and uh, at some point you don't really want to read everything. It should look like a hieroglyphic of some kind. The Monte Carlo, I'm going to definitely be able to read that, however. It'll be the, one of the names of the painting, Monte Carlo Fire Pit. Um, so now I'm going to be working on these window banks and there isn't a whole lot to do except that the frame of these windows has a nice violet uh, cool on them that I think will be a good contrast with all the warmth in this painting. So let's try to find a cool color that matches what I'm thinking. It shouldn't be too bright. I don't want to break up the mass of that window. Uh, but let's see how this looks. Okay. That's just borderline bright, but I think it's going to work. I'm going to just add a little more violet. Okay, let's go a little darker. We'll do another one right here. And there's a little of that going on in the other uh, bank of uh, windows as well. I'm not going to 
make these quite as visible. I want that to recede a little bit. Make them narrower. And I won't clean my brush in between strokes. So there. So now it's time to start getting into some of the funner details. I think I've, I've fixed most of the things I wanted to fix and the rest now become details that I'll be adding. Uh, I could make these taillights just slightly brighter. If you actually look at taillights in real life compared to street lights and so forth, they're very bright. So let me just add a little orange and uh, maybe a little yellow as well. Just to the middle of that light. Very subtle. I don't know what you can really tell. <laughs> Let's keep going. One more thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to expand the halo on this light. This light is closer to me than that one. And typically that would have a bigger halo. So I'm going to go ahead and recreate a halo around it. So the way I originally showed you to do a halo is how I typically would start them. But at some point, you can kind of ad lib how you actually put the paint down to create the halo. As long as you know the concept is that you're moving prismatically from the light source out into the surrounding uh, darkness. Now I notice I put a little more orangey red out overlying this building, which is lighter than the sky behind. And now when I move out to the sky, I'm going to go down one more notch in the prism to violet. Maybe sneak back a little bit of uh, scarlet right here. And then I'm going to try to blend that with a color mixture that is crossed between this and what I have down for my halo. So I have to remember what I put down there. I think I had yellow and, and phthalo and brown for that mixture with a little red in it. Anyway, the exact color mixtures, again, it's nothing, they're nothing to actually memorize. Instead, you want to think about what color are you trying to get to. And there's a million ways to get to all these different colors. So that's the way I recommend that you think about it as far as think about what, it, what you want it to look like there. So already I, I've expanded that halo and I think it made it a little more prominent than that halo, which that was my goal. I'm just going to blend now the uh, violet color with my sky color. At some point, I've already put two layers down in the sky, but it looks a little bit messy to me. I can see brush strokes everywhere that are bothering me. So time permitting, at the very end, I may add one more thin coat of paint to the sky at which time I can kind of work on some of these halos a little more. There, I think that's accomplishing what I wanted to do. It's a little darker than sky right now, right? So uh, if I don't darken my sky up, I should probably lighten that halo just slightly. I'm going to just add a little cadmium to it. See if I can get it lighter than the sky. And if I can't, I'll add a little bit of white or king's blue, which I just did. And now it's lighter than the sky. Okay. All right, let's start adding some details. There's some snow on this roof that is catching some nice reflected light from the neon. So let's put that down. I'm going to put that down initially as a violet. Violety blue, which is snow catching sky color. And then over into that, we'll paint the uh, reflected pink light. Okay. Let's put a little on this side of the building also. I think I'm going to add that same color to this snow bank right here. 
and to the ground plane down here. I think that looks nicer. So since I'm using this snow color there, I'm going to put some down in the snow pile here as well. Trying to keep this more of a mass, not to put too much detail in it right away. And as a mass, I want it to have form, so I'm going to make this side dark for now, a little lighter on the top, and then later on add the reflected light. So let me just make it a little lighter on the top. Just use a light violet. Let's go ahead and add the pink now to that uh, snow on the roof. I'm just going to use a little bit of red, a little bit of alizarin, and white. Make sure I get something bright enough that it shows. There it is. I might even go a little more towards cad red light or scarlet. There it is. I like that color for reflected light on snow, so I'm going to use that again down here on the valet stand and a little bit here on this snow pile. Okay, so it would also be a good time now to put this down on the snow pile in front. It's a little more luminous in front, so I'm going to just add a little more red, I think, to it. The value might be a hair darker also. Let's see how this looks. I don't think that's a bad place to start. I'm going to stop right about here. I don't want to get too carried away with this. We'll stop right there for now. I want to have uh, a little red glow onto this snow pile again. I've kind of lost that. Let me just add some back. And then also here. I'm going to keep this snow pile a little bit more violet, though. All right, let's keep going with some details. Uh, let's get some windows on the back building. So I don't want those too bright. I want them to really uh, almost match the value of the building, just slightly lighter. I'm going to go with a bluish green tint, and we'll just put a few in. I want to make, try to make the windows all just a little bit different, so at the next bank I'll just put a little orange in with it. And again, now the next row of windows down below ha have light in them, so let's go ahead and make kind of a murky orangey yellow and put that down. Nothing too elaborate. Let's make one different. I'll just add a little blue back into this. A 
Okay. Now, within the uh, banks of windows back here, we're seeing through into a, it's actually a lighting store, but there's going to be a few brighter areas within that which represent the, the lights that are shining on everything. So I've just took a little bit of white and dulled it down with some yellow and some mud. And let's put a couple hints of light sources in there. Okay. There's a light off into the distance over here that's warm and it's warming up this side of that distant building. I'm going to go ahead and put a little orange in that, orangey red, mixed with that building color. Anytime you can identify a prismatic color shift and a value shift it makes the painting a lot more interesting, so be looking for those. Okay, I'm going to go back to this illuminated side of the wall again, and I'm going to reinforce some of the darks in those windows. And because the only light illuminating that area really is that, that uh, neon light, I'm, I'm going to make the dark areas of this alizarin and not violet. They still will look violet, but believe me, there's a red in there. Okay. And there's a shadow down the middle. I'm going to start with that same alizarin. And there's also alizarin in this wood trim right here. And there will be some up in this piece of trim as well. Up there I'm going to add a little more violet as well. Okay, let's finish off that shadow. I think that's reading pretty well right now. There's some brighter red uh, reflecting in those windows. And then at the end, I'm going to put reflection of the lettering in the window as well. But let me get the red in. Most prominent there, and it's also prominent at the very top where the, it catches the under part of the sill. And then if I can see any red on this other side, I'm going to put it in. It actually looks closer to a scarlet over on that side. I'm going to lighten it just a little. Back to a little darker. A few darks on that other window that I should reinforce. Again, a go with the lizard again. Okay. So at this point now, I'm going to get the reflections of the Monte Carlo sign into that window. So let's go ahead and pull out a yellow orange. going to be almost the exact value and color as the sign itself because it's almost exactly a mirror. 
So let's try that. Okay. Might put a little more uh, scarlet in that. And that to me now looks like light reflected into that window. Okay, let's get some poles in, light poles. The first one I'm going to put in is a pole on this tall street lamp. There's usually a gooseneck end on that. And there's a portion of the light pole that usually we see better than the rest. And that's something just directly across from and lower than the light source itself. So I'm going to take an orange darker than the the light source itself, of course, and I'm going to go ahead and make a gooseneck pole like so. And I think I can actually leave it just like that. We know that it's going to keep going down. Uh, let's do now the same thing for this street uh, lamp post, this lower street light. And that'll be similar. It's going to have a illuminated part of the pole and then down lower it'll become dark. So let me just take a not quite an orange, maybe a red, and we'll go right down the middle of this one. And at this point I can continue that down with a dark color and I think that should read correctly. So I got a little violet, a little brown. I don't want it just, I don't want it to be drastically dark because it's a narrow thing. Let's see how this looks. Now we've got some poles uh, that hold up the canopy. And again, they're narrow, so I don't want to make them overly dark, but I definitely want it dark. And let's go ahead and pull one down from here. Even if I can just show it where it crosses an area of light, your, your brain will fill in the rest, so, and the brain likes to do that kind of thing. So, that's one pole. And there's going to be another one on the other side. This one I'm going to take down a little further. Okay. All right. Any other light posts I want to put in? Actually, actually there is one uh, right across from these green lights, the stop lights. There's a nice blue street sign that I want to get. Before I do that, one thing that has bothered me about these street lights is that I have, they look like targets. I, they have a sharp outer margin to the halo. I want to just blend that outer margin of the halo in with the sky a little bit better. So I'm going to just mix a phthalo green, maybe just a hair uh, lighter white, see how that looks. And I'm just going to dull the edge where it meets the sky. Okay, so that feels better to me. All right, let's go ahead and put the street sign in. I'm going to pick manganese for this, and I'll just put straight manganese down and let's see if it's bright enough. It's almost bright enough. I'm just going to add a little bit of white to that. There we go. I think that looks good. Okay, let's keep going down my list of details. There's a license plate on the car that'll make that look a little more realistic. And that gets a little bit of yellow light from a license plate light. And it's going to have a little bit of red in it leaking over from the 
the glare from the lights. So let me put this color down and see how it looks. Okay, that's not bad. I'm going to start losing an edge off to the right side where it's partially shadowed. Okay, and let's put one more on the car up here. All right, there's a nice area of reflected light in the gutter next to the sidewalk here. And it's coming from this uh, street light. So I'm going to take a, a color that's darker than the street light, but fairly chromatic. So I'm going to go almost straight cad yellow, just cad yellow, and lay down a line where I see one. And just soften the edge a little bit, pull it out into the road. Might put a little cad yellow light into that. And these are reflections, so I might see a little bit more up here, a little bit here. So I want to make sure it's recognizable as what it is uh, and that it's at the right angle. <laughs> Let's try that. I think that's all right. Maybe a little bit creeping up into this driveway right here. That curb side is catching a lot of red light from the tail light. I'm going to make sure I get that. So I'll mix some red and alizarin. Okay, I don't want too sharp an edge here. I might just kind of fluff that into the sidewalk a little bit and soften that edge. I feel like I have the masses all in right now and I feel comfortable that uh, everything is reasonably uh, keyed as far as value and color. So now I can continue to have fun with these details. If you don't have the rest of it done, you shouldn't be doing the details, but right now I believe we can get to that point. So I'm going to go ahead and draw some other things in this image. One would be the uh, roadside marking right here. this line and it's mostly red but there'll be some value and color changes near the uh, where the light hits it. I'm going to make it a little more orange near the, the tail light. And then towards the viewer I want it to catch a little more of the sky color so I'll go with some violet, mix it with another pile of violet that I had, and let's add that down here. And maybe in between the two, a little area of red or pink. So I think that's fine. There's one more line in the, uh, on the pavement right here, and I think we'll put that in. Once in a while, just like with everything else, I will draw it out first to make sure that I get it where I want it. If I'm wrong, it's easy to change it at this point, uh, but I think that actually worked out just fine. And this light has a little more white in it, so I'm just going to take kind of a creamy white, mix it with this pink, and we'll start with that color. Okay, and then I'm going to get the red again, 
or a reddish light or like a scarlet color. And wherever this light reflection hits it, I'm going to just put a little red down. So straight down from this light, a little bit of red. Okay. Now I'm going to do some more top planes on the cars ahead of this one and some side planes. I'm going to start with a kind of an orangey yellow and we'll do the side plane of this car. And then a combination of yellow and green to do the top plane of that car. I don't want it to compete with the front car, so I'll make it a little fainter. Cut back a little bit with that. And let's put some green, a uh, sliver of green light on the top of that car also. Again from the street light. And there's one more further down. I'm just going to make it a uh, yellowy green color, actually. And I'm, I made that up, but it should work. Let's try it. So I think that reads as a row of cars. I'm going to just change one color, and that's right along this side of this car. Make it a little brighter. And then there's this car, which has, it's going to have green from the stoplight again, and maybe a little blue on the top. Let's go ahead and put this in. A little less detail on those distant cars, just show a top plane. And occasionally a side plane, I'll put another one on. Okay, so I think those cars are reading fine. The next thing to add will be the row of lights back here that aren't in the reference image, but they were on my plein air piece because they had the lights on at the time. And I'm going to mark them first with my the end of my uh, brush. There was a bulb here, and then there's a string of lights that was kind of curvilinear this way. Uh, let's make two strings. And I'll put lights on these strings, slightly random, but planned. And that's where I'm going to put them. So around those lights, which will be cool yellow lights, I'm going to make some uh, phthalo and yellow mixture. And lay that down first as a halo. Remember I told you that some of the smaller lights, you can just make small halos and and get by without doing the blending thing uh, the way we initially did it. But I, I will still blend these as it goes off into the wall. I'm going to add a little brown and more darker, uh, a little darker green and put that down. Looks like it needs just a little more warmth. Okay, and I think I will blend that just a little bit with the wall and try to find that wall color again, which was violet with a little bit of green and just a little bit of orange or scarlet. Let's try scarlet. A bit dark. Let's just make it a little lighter. There we go. And let's blend those halos. Good. Now let's go ahead and put the lights in and see if I need to adjust the halos. Let's use cad yellow light. 
a little bit of white and just a little phthalo. My medium on this second pass, I have less turpentine in it or less OMS, um, mainly Galkid and oil. So that's about the right color and value. A little bright, maybe. I don't want to my eye to go too much over there so it's easy at this point to just reinforce a halo around it and at the same time I can dim those a little bit so I'm going to grab a little bit of phthalo maybe add a little bit of orange to it and I'm going to try to reinstate the halo And I blur the, the light just a little bit at the same time. I think that's a better intensity. It's not as distracting. I'm getting close to putting in figures soon. Uh, before I do that, I want to clean up this back parking lot. It, there's a lot of dark cars back there, and each of those cars has a few bright reflectors on them. So I'm going to go ahead and just take a dark pigment and just start painting in some rooftops. Okay. Everything has kind of a greenish cast back there because the light that is back there is a cool light. I'm going to add a little phthalo to these dark shapes. It would be nice to um, have these bushes overlap with this dark line. So I'm going to do that right now. I'll just add a little sky color to these bushes. And let's have them come up a little higher. I think that's less distracting to have those darks connected. Okay, and almost. Okay, I'm back, and I'm about to put some figures into this scene. I'm going to start with a pretty big brush. I want to get an, enough pigment in my brush to lay this down over paint in a fairly dark way. This is actually a little too big. Let me start with this brush. Um, I've got my plein air piece. And for this piece, I had a friend of mine stand here and pretend he was smoking a cigarette. I mainly wanted the height of the figure relative to the building. And then similarly, I caught a picture of two people sitting on this bench, again, to show me the height. But once I know the height of the figure, I kind of doodle until I get something that looks like what I want uh, based on my knowledge of the figure. So I'm going to use that to show me height. And here we go. Let's put the people on the bench first. They're being illuminated by the fire. And other than that, they're pretty dark silhouettes. So I'm going to start them as silhouettes.
and the heads of these figures end up about right here. And then if you imagine this is the bench, I know that they're going to be seated like so. And there'll be a shadow back here where their feet are. And I'm going to put two figures in. Let's put one leaning forward just slightly, a little lower than the first. Something like that. I'm already, you can kind of tell, they probably are figures, right? But I'm going to put some shadows in where I think they need to be placed. So, for instance, on the seat next to them, there should be a shadow that's lighter than the figure themselves, but darker than the, the chair. So I'll put a little darkness right here. Okay. So that is the silhouette for the two figures sitting next to the fire. I'm going to be putting some uh, highlights on those in a minute, and that should uh, complete those figures that you don't need much. At the same time, I'm going to paint the, the fire pit and try to connect those darks. All right, now I'm going to put the second figure, or third figure, in, and that will be a person standing next to this ballet stand. Again, I'll start with a dark silhouette. And the head on this figure is about here. And that means his feet will be straight down, right there, roughly. So if these people are seated, a standing figure would be about here, and that would make sense for perspective. So this will be the head right there. All right, I'm going to just go ahead and put down a silhouette. A little contamination from the white behind it, so I'm going to just add a little more paint right there. I'm going to imagine the shoulders right about here. One arm coming back up with a cigarette. By the way, I don't condone smoking, but I think the glow from a cigarette will be a nice addition of a, a light, uh, glowing light over here. So. I put it in. It's real life. Okay, so you can kind of see already where my figure is going. I'm going to take some of that same dark and reestablish some shadows at the base of this uh, stand. Probably someone wearing a coat. But at this point, that's probably all I need for that figure. Minus the uh, highlights, which will create the light effect. All right. So I'm going to do the highlights on these figures next. In addition, there's reflected light from this fire onto those figures. So I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to take a little bit of red. And by laying it over those dark figures that are still wet, 
uh, I should get kind of a blend of silhouette with some warmth on it. So I'm going to pretend there's the front of someone's coat right here, maybe an arm coming across. This person has a hand down there. And then the faces are going to catch most of the light. So I'm going to go to my orange. I might be able to go straight orange on those. Let's take a look and see how that looks. Okay, there's one. I'm going to change the color just a little for the second figure. And we'll put a second figure right here. A little bright spot on the hand. So I think anyone knows that those are figures. They're not really elaborate, but they don't have to be. It's not about them. Uh, I'm going to put a little warmth back on the chairs next to them. Right now they read as pretty cool, but they should be warm with, if they catch a little bit of the light of the, the uh, fire. So I'll put a little warmth on the back here. Same with these chairs. And maybe even the front of this chair right here, of the seat. Okay. All right, let's put some, uh, some light on the, big f the tall figure. I'm going to go with orange and scarlet. Let's make it just a little bit redder glow than these. Uh, and it's going to be the same color that I'm going to put in the hand holding the cigarette, so I might make it just a little redder. And so if he's holding a cigarette like that, I will have a little bit of color right there. So right now you can imagine that's a face with a hand next to it. And now if I just go st usually straight, uh, Scarlet, maybe add a little orange and try to put a very fine dot down. I, it should look like the end of a cigarette, so let's try to do that. Okay. And then there'll be a little glow from that cigarette. So let's prismatically shift and get a little darker. And on the face near that cigarette, I'm going to put just a little more color and glow. It's fairly subtle. I might uh, put a little more skin tone on him further away from the cigarette, prismatically shifting to alizarin and moving away from the cigarette. Okay. Now, if I can get a little rim light on this figure, I think it'll help define it just slightly. I don't want it too defined. I want it to be kind of mysteriously lost in the, in the uh, shadow, but there's a green light over here. I'm going to use that as my uh, rim light color and just try to show one side of this figure.
I think that's a little prominent, but I can cut that back a little bit and dull it down slightly. I'll just add a little violet. I think that reads okay. I got the legs a little skinny on that figure. I'm going to just change it a little bit. It's actually not bad. I think the elbow should be sticking out just a little more. Right there. And then I'm going to put this arm in his pocket. Something like that. Okay, so I've got three figures and I've got some light effect going. Might darken one side of the cheek right now. There we go. All right, uh, I need to take one quick break and check my list one more time. Okay, I'm back. And uh, we're still now in final touches. And some of the things that I do during the day for final touches is I look for light on top planes. And there are a few top planes here that could use some attention. And one would be the top of the chairs right here, which will catch a little bit of light from the light source inside the canopy. So I'm going to go ahead and put those down. Light top planes. Okay. I don't want them too prominent. If I have to dull them down after I place them, I'll do that, which I'm going to do right now. All right. There is, there should be more of a transition from light to dark inside the canopy because the lights in there are mainly coming from here. So I'm going to go ahead and just pull some yellow out, add it to that white mixture that I have in front of me, and put it down right here. I want to lose this edge where the two meet. Okay. The uh, light on the ground here, I, I tried to straighten it already with the shadow. I've got to add a little bit of orange back into this on a more horizontal plane, just to define that sidewalk, sidewalk as flatter, which it is. And that actually works pretty well. Okay, um, I'm going to put some bright reflectors in now. We talked about that in the talk. These are mirror-like surfaces that reflect light from multiple different light sources in the area. And so I'm going to mix just kind of a bright yellow and look for some reflectors that I might have missed uh, on the first go-around. I can see there'll be a bright reflector on the license plate itself. I'll put a little dot. This can be maybe more than a dot, maybe just a little stroke, something like that. On the edge of this car, there's a brighter area right there. Probably catching some light from those windows. There are Probably some reflecting areas over on this um, stand, this uh, ballet stand. I'm going to put one in there, but this is a, remember that's a cool light back there. So I'm going to mix a little phthalo in with this color. It's still going to be bright, but it's going to be on the cool side. And I'll put a little dot of that on the edge of that 
And that's the same color I'm going to use for these cars in back. Uh, looking for top planes that are lit up, little bright reflectors. Even along the top of the fence on that side, there might be a few. Okay. Now, it's easy to get carried away. I probably got carried away a little bit. I'm just going to wipe a little bit of that out. Go back with the dark in there. All right. So anywhere else I can find them, I'll put them down. There's a kind of a green reflector on the ground. It's probably a little piece of snow right there. There'll be lots of this on the snow pile itself. And there's some yellowy green ones back here. I don't want to get these too prominent, but definitely there's more there than what I had. These are kind of yellowy. I guess you'd almost call these, this is just reflected light, but I'm also looking for areas of reflected light. All right. A little more reflected light on the ground right here. I'm going to get a nice area of pink reflected light on the uh, snow pile back here. Go to my magenta again, mix it with a little bit of scarlet and white. Same color out here. And there's a little bit of that, maybe even a little darker, however, down here. I'm not sure I want to put any more detail back here. There's a lot more I could do, but I think I will not. I don't want to bring my eye over there too much. I might try to, uh, as part of the final steps, I, that includes reinforcing some dark darks, as well as looking for these bright reflectors. So I'm going to look for some dark darks right now. I believe there's one right here. I think I can get some areas of this tree a little darker. especially next to that figure, help that figure kind of blend in a little bit. And I want to lose some edges up here. So I'm going to overpaint the tree and then I'll paint some sky back over that. I think there's one kind of a nebulous area and that is back here. And I want to do something that doesn't drag my eye too startlingly over there, but I want it to still look real. I think what that will require will be some uh, light on the pavement, which would probably be somewhat reddish violet because it's going to still catch some 
color from people's tails, tail lights. I think that helps a little. And at some point that will blend with the sky. So let me get some sky color again. Remember it was cooler down at the bottom, cooler and lighter. I think I just hit it right there pretty well. There are a couple of areas of light that reflect off the windows of the Monte Carlo. One is, and I'm not sure if it's on the inside or the outside of the building, but it's distinctly orangey scarlet right there. And that'll help. Uh, it's good to see the same color in different areas of the painting. It adds to some unity. And then, there is a light on the inside of the building over here that I do want to get. Uh, it's not as important, I don't think, because it doesn't offer much color, but I like something filling that space just to show there's something going on in the building. So right about here. And I might put a little halo around it, just barely. There's a little more reflected light uh, on that side of the, the uh, tree in real life. So I'm going to put that on from what I remember and what I have done on my plein air piece. It's just a little of this color coming over. As it blends into darkness, it becomes prismatically a little more uh, alizarin. I want to just uh, trim out these windows just a little better and I'm going to do that with a warm color because like I said it was there's going to be a little glow around those windows so let me just pick out a orangey brown and improve this. All right. This is looking a little black to me right there, so I'm going to add a little warmth to that planter and probably a little tree in there. So I'll just make a more of a brownish violet. I don't really want it darker than the windows it sits next to. Let me just put a little bit of Thalo mixed with that, this thalo yellow mixture, it should be lighter in value, it is. Okay. I'm going to put a little more darkness on this side of the snow uh, and a little more warmth. And try to create some form with the side plane different than the top plane. And I think it'll kind of tone down some of the color that I had in there. It, need, it needed some neutrals. I'm going to see if I can do any of that over here as well. A 
And I'm going to put the cap on that uh, roof. I like how that looks. It's more neutral compared to the wall itself. I'm going to add a little bit of black, a little bit of orange, maybe just a little green. making it darker as I go back and I'm just grabbing kind of some darker grays off my palette. I think that looks right. I think the window near the neon, I think I could improve it by putting uh, just a couple subtle lighter red accents where the crossbars are on the window. So I'm going to try to find that for you right here. I think it just makes it a little more interesting. Straight orange. And then I think back on the sidewalk back here, near this lamp, there'll be a little more orange on the sidewalk. I think there's a little more white on the ground playing right here from the light of the car, add that. I'm going to look for some bright reflection along this side of the car and also the uh, side mirror I think would help make that look more real. And if I was going to guess on a color that would be hitting the side of that car, it would be pink. So I'm going to mix kind of a reddish pink. Something like that. Might even be a little pink on this car. Now I look around to see if anything is bothering me. I think uh, I can reinstate some color in the uh, lamp post light. I'm just going to make a little cleaner whitish yellow, warm yellow, so it's cad yellow, not cad yellow light. Pretty bright. <laughs> I'm going to dull it down just a little bit by hitting the edges with straight yellow. And that'll serve as part of the halo again, too. A little bit of that on the post. And I think that would make for a nice reflection right on the corner of that car. Go back with a little more yellow for that halo. I think that's kind of an important halo actually, so I want to get that one right. Transition from yellow to orange.
I might put a little bit of a yellow highlight or orange highlight on the fence near that light. So right about here. And maybe a couple out in the cars as well. I'm going to just enhance some of the color on the building. I darkened it down to make sure my value is correct. That's the most important part. But now if I can somehow improve that color just a little bit, if I go to some straight orange right here, still darker than the sign. And as I go down, I'm just going to start adding a little more yellow. And I'm going to add a little more red up top. I think I should probably fix the arrow on that sign. And I'm going to reinstate the reflection in the window next to the sign. Also going to read and state the pink on the top of this building or this uh, awning. Have it trail off a little bit onto the curved parts of this awning. And then a little pink coming through the awning again, right here. Even a little bit of yellowy orange right here. I'm going to clean up the edge around this side of the awning and there's some pink on the building of course next to it so let's use some pink. Okay and I'm going to just darken that slightly as I move away from the light source. Darken it and shift it. Okay I'm going to take a break. And we'll come back and see if there's any last things to do. Okay, I'm back. And one of the last things I'd like to do is to repaint the sky. I'm using a badger hair brush, very soft brush, but it's large enough I can get enough paint on it, I believe, to fairly quickly repaint the sky. And my goal here is that I want to make it a little darker and warmer so it doesn't look quite so blue-purple. And at the same time, some of this halo got darker than my sky over here. So I'm going to make the sky darker down to about here and then leave the rest of it roughly that value. So I'm going to get started with a good sky color and I, I will almost always start with violet. I'll put a little brown in that. Maybe even a little black and a little bit of green. Let's see how that looks. Actually, it works great for this guy. I just wanted it dark and I wanted it a little bit on the warm side. I'm going to start shifting that to alizarin as I get closer to the lit side of the building. OK, 
Okay. I'll keep the very top of this that color and then I'll lighten it just slightly coming down. This is very dark, but it won't be for much of the sky, just the very top. One thing that nocturnes do for you is it kind of, uh, you learn to paint darker than you used to. Sometimes that backfires. Sometimes you end up painting things too dark, but you can always lighten. So I'm going to stick with this violet. I'm going to just add a little bit more of the King's blue to it and a little more alizarin now. Let's see if I don't get a red or violet, which I seem to be getting. A little more alizarin and I'm adding a little cobalt blue to it this time. It'll just help it, help it be a little bit lighter than what I have. And by having this black and brown in here, it's looking a little less purple to me, which is, that was my goal. Violet's okay. Purple, I don't like. I think this will help solidify the painting a little bit by having a nice clean sky. I'm going to put a little of that on the ground right now just to make sure that I tie that in. Okay, black to cobalt, a little bit of alizarin, and I got it just one step lighter, barely. All right, now at this point, it's clear that my sky is darker than the halo. But there's still some warm color out there. I'm going to lighten things up just a little bit. I'll use my lighter blues. And I'll maybe add the magenta, a little bit of the king's blue. I still have some black and brown in this mixture, so it should prevent me from getting too, uh, too blue. I can see now that I have to add a little more darkness. There we go. Bluer and lighter. Now at this point, I don't think I want to go much lighter until I get around this halo. I don't want to have to repaint that halo. I will make it a little smaller. Yep.
All right, we'll keep getting lighter. I'm going to start moving into that manganese a little bit. And maybe even a little phthalo. This has a richer look than what, it, what I started with, just because I've got a better transition in the sky and some good darkness for these lights to play off of. You can see I just cut off one of the halos. I'm going to re-extend that, this orange one. And I'll just put a little bit of alizarin and red together. Maybe a little scarlet. I think that almost brings it back. Add a little more orange. It probably wouldn't hurt to have some light in, on the distant road from the headlights of that car. I'm going to use a bluish gray and just put some out in front of that car and see what I think. Yeah, I think that's better. I can even lighten that just slightly. Might add a little yellow to that mixture. I think that's better. The uh, bushes in the back here, I think, can have just a, more of a, of a green tint to them because there's a green light back there. That reads okay. And now I look around for anything that's bothering me. And one thing that I see is that I think there can be some darker darks in these planters I'm, and they look warmer. So I'm going to go ahead and mix a violet with some brown. Something like that. And similarly on the far side of these bushes. Take one last look at the neon. I want to make sure I get that right. Looks a little chalky to me right there. I'm just going to take a little bit of alizarin, a little orange. Just hit that once. And I'm going to take alizarin again. Just put a little bit up here. I think there can be a little more dark on this piece of wood right here. And on the top one as well. Actually, I gotta dull this one back. There's one thing that might make this look a little more dimensional, and that is if I show um, an edge on that trim, right where, it, where you see the side of the trim right here. It's very subtle. 
but I like what that does. Same thing up here. We're going to try to touch up this canopy a little bit. There's some details that might help. And let's start by putting in the stripes on the back side of the canopy. And I've done this once before. I'm going to try to do a better job this time. I'm just going to put some color back there, some reddish orangey brown. Now I'm going to restate the yellowy color underneath the awning next to those stripes. Make sure I'm not getting it too bright. Now it's just borderline. Let me just add a little yellow-orange to it. I like it better. And I might try adding that sky color back to the awning on the, in the dark areas. Looks to be warmer than this part of the sky. So I'm going to take a little more violet back into that color. And a little alizarin. One more time. I'm not really sure I'm changing too much, but my intentions were good. Just make it a little darker on the side plane. Third of the way down, I'm just going to add a little lighter uh, dark right here. Yeah, that might work. Where it catches a little more sky. It also is, anytime I can see a warm and cool relationship next to each other, if I put it down, I'm usually happier. So I think that is one of those situations. A little darker figure in the ballet shed. So, uh, that concludes this portion of the video. Uh, this was the more complicated of the two uh, demonstrations that I'm going to do. I think there's a lot of information here that uh, 
someone will find useful no matter what level you're at. Um, there's lots of things I would continue to do with this painting if I had it back in my studio. I tend to fiddle with them until nothing bothers me anymore or very little bothers me anymore. And there's a few subtle things that I, that I would still change in this painting. Nonetheless, I'm happy with the way the major shapes turned out and the value relationships that I got. And I think I also demonstrated some areas of prismatic color shift that I consider to be important for these uh, Nocturne videos. So that's it. If you want to see more of my work, I'm at carlbretzky.com. Thank you.